Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Different everyone's from 15 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago. Um, and welcome to the first ever joint meeting of the Planning Committee and the Community and Protective Services Committee. And uh, it makes sense that joint committees, joint meetings of our two committees would be rare. The terms of reference for both of these committees and each of them is quite different. But for the sake of efficiency, Chair Luloff and I agreed it would be best for us to meet jointly on the matter before us today. Our agenda is dedicated to, to a proposed bylaw and related zoning recommendations needed to set the rules for short-term residential rentals in Ottawa. A joint meeting not only gives staff the opportunity to explain how the two reports relate to one another, it also streamlines the public uh, submission and delegation process. Speakers won't need to take time out of their schedules to appear at two separate meetings. I'll get into some logistics shortly about how we will proceed with discussion today but before I do that, I would first like to invite Chair Luloff to offer a statement of land acknowledgement. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair Harder. Ottawa is built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation have lived on this territory for millennia. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. The City of Ottawa honors the peoples and the land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. The City of Ottawa honors all First Nations, Inuit, and Mitzi people and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. And now Chair Harder has some logistical information to share. Thank you, Chair Lula. The next thing we need to do is a roll call for um, of all 19 members of the two committees. Councillor, Councillor Meehan had sent her regrets, but she's here, you're, you're still here. There you are, Carolyn, thank you. Um, I also remind everyone that we need 10 members present at all times to maintain quorum. So we'll do the roll call. Councillor Brockington? Good morning. Councillor Cluche? Present. Councillor Deans? Councillor Dudas? Here. Councillor El Chantiri? Present. Councillor Fleury? Bonjour. Councillor Hubley? Here. Councillor Kavanaugh? Here. Councillor Kitts? Here. Councillor Leeper? Good morning. Councillor McKenney? Here. Councillor Meehan? Here. Councillor Moffat? Here. Councillor Suds? Here. Councillor Tierney? Present. Uh, Vice Chair Gower? Here. Council, uh, Vice Chair Egli may be not here yet, but he's coming. He will. Uh, Chair Luloff? I am here. And so am I. Thank you. We have quorum. Do any members wish to uh, make a declaration of interest? Seeing none. In a few minutes, I will invite staff to give us a joint presentation on the two reports. Following the presentation, I will ask the members of both committees to introduce any motions or directions they intend to move today. That way other members and staff will have time to review those motions and if necessary, seek clarification as we discuss the reports. Public delegations will also benefit from hearing such motions before they are asked to speak. So if you haven't already, please send any motions to our coordinator and motions at ottawa.ca. After motions are introduced, we'll move directly to hearing public delegations. After each delegation speaks, Members can ask them questions as usual, but we will hold questions to staff until all delegations have finished. You should also know that we will consider the reports in tandem throughout the day, that is until it's time to vote. We need to record the vote on each report's recommendations separately. Now, I know that most everyone is well acquainted with Zoom meetings at this point, it's only been a year that we've been using Zoom. So I will just remind you to keep your mics muted when not speaking and to raise your hand virtually when you want to speak. For delegations who are currently listening from the virtual lobby, awaiting your turn to speak, you do not need to raise your hand. 
Clerk's office staff will let you into the meeting when it's your turn and you will have five minutes to speak the same as all delegations. When you are invited in, you will need to unmute your own microphone. You are also welcome to turn your camera on while you speak, but you are not required to do so. If you provided our committee coordinator with the presentation in advance, she will share it from her screen while you speak. You can ask her to advance slides as you wish. The coordinator will aim to give you a one minute warning as the clock counts down your five minutes to give you time to wrap up. But after each speaker, Chair Luloff or myself will announce the next two or three delegations on deck. That will give those waiting in the Zoom lobby or following on YouTube a cue that their speaking time is approaching. I should also point out that we do have French and English language interpreters on duty for this meeting. At the bottom of your Zoom window, you will see an option for interpretation and you can select which audio channel you prefer to use. Before we go any further, I do need to read a statement because this is a public hearing under the Planning Act. This is a public meeting to consider the proposed zoning bylaw amendment listed as item one on today's agenda. For the item just mentioned, only those who make oral submissions today or written submissions before the amendments are adopted may appeal the matter to the local planning appeal tribunal. In addition, the applicant may appeal the matter to the local planning appeal tribunal if council does not adopt an amendment within 90 days of receipt of the application for zoning and 120 days for an official plan amendment. To submit written comments on these amendments prior to, these, to their consideration by city council, which will be April 28th, please email or call the committee or council coordinator. All right, I think that's it for the housekeeping. We do have several delegations signed up to speak to us about these reports, so we don't wanna take up too much more time. But before we invite staff to present, Chair Luloff and I would both like to provide some thoughts on what's before us today. This stems from a strategy that council approved more than a year ago in November, 2019. Staff had been hard at work ever since figuring out the best way to implement that strategy, which calls for regulating the short-term rental of principal residents for a three-year trial period. In short, implementation is what's before us today. I'm sure there's an argument to be made for revisiting the approved strategy, especially given the way the world has changed with the pandemic, but our committees need to limit the scope of the discussion today to the matter at hand. We will not, for instance, revisit debate about whether short-term rentals should be permitted outside of an operator's principal residence. We know there are those who disagree with the approach council approved to restrict short-term rentals to principal residences only. That decision was made after much deliberation and with the clear rationale that such an approach would reduce the negative impacts of investment properties on housing availability and affordability. We won't revisit that debate, just as we won't revisit debate about whether to prohibit short-term rentals altogether. Nor will we consider council's decision to reject landlord licensing as part of this pilot. Those matters are decided and cannot be revisited without waiving the rules of procedure. The city will proceed with a three-year trial based on the council approved strategy. And Chair Luloff and I are advising that you restrict discussion to the matters at hand, that is the specific regulations that staff are recommending. The bylaw aims to ensure staff can manage the issues that residents have told us concern them about short-term rentals. That includes rules to help limit potential community nuisances and to address anticipated issues around consumer protection, public safety and protection of property. And they lay out the measures described, prescribed in the bylaw to enable enforcement, including significant fines and the ability to revoke a host permit. I won't get into more detail as the staff presentation will outline regulations proposed for guests, hosts, property managers, and short-term rental platforms. But as the chair of planning committee, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the related zoning report. It's a fairly straightforward report that is really only needed because the zoning bylaw doesn't currently permit short-term rental of residential units in residential zones, other than as a hotel use. The amendment would temporarily introduce a new definition to permit short-term rental use more broadly during the three-year trial period. I'm sure that most of today's discussion will focus more on the new bylaw than on the zoning piece, but having the zoning report considered in tandem with the bylaw 
is a good reminder of how important our zoning bylaw is in shaping our communities. The zoning bylaw gives the city significant control over changes at the neighborhood level. It's not just about dictating what new buildings can be built, but what uses are acceptable within existing ones. It really is just as important a document as the official plan. And for that reason, I want to encourage you all to be involved as possible as staff develop a new zoning bylaw over the next few years. It's not something to consider today, but I felt this was a good opportunity to drive that point home. Now I'd like to invite Chair Lulov to say a few words. I'd like to thank everyone that joined us today, as well as all other members of the planning service and CSPC uh, to uh, cooperate so closely with the uh, development of those two reports. to make sure the uses in the bylaw are all permitted. I'm looking forward to your presentations to give us a clear overview of how the new bylaw will address the issues at hand as we launch into this short-term mental uh, trial period. As Chair Harder has made very clear, today we will not consider the regulations proposed by staff uh, sorry, we will only consider the regulations proposed by staff to implement the approved short-term rental strategy. We are in full agreement that we will not be revisiting the decision to restrict short-term rentals to principal residences, nor other related debates that have already been decided by council. We are in total agreement to say that we will not come back on the decision to restrict short-term rentals to uh, principal residences and won't get back to the other debates either that were uh, uh, done at council. The regulations before us and how they will help the city manage community nuisance issues and preserve housing stock for Ottawa residents. So with that on record, I'll turn it back over to Chair Harder to introduce the staff presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And I see that Layla Gibbons is, uh, is uh, right before us. Layla, I'm going to leave it to you to introduce your staff that you have with you today. And Great, thank, thank you for your presentation. Great, thank you, Chairs, and good morning, Councillors. Uh, for those of you who are watching, my name is Layla Gibbons, and I'm the Associate General Manager of Emergency Protective Services. So today's special joint meeting of Committee of Community Protective Services and Planning Committees has been called to consider staff's recommendations for new short-term rental regulations. Staff will present two reports today, the Emergency Protective Services Department's report on the proposed short-term rental bylaw and uh, the companion report on the zoning bylaw amendments um, to, per to permit the short-term rental and residential dwelling units citywide prepared by planning, infrastructure, and economic development. Together, the recommendations of these reports are intended to deliver the regulations um, based on the regulatory framework approved by Council in November of 2019. We have a brief presentation to outline the total effect of the proposed measures. And joining me today for the presentations are uh, Valerie Bietlo, uh, Manager of Public Policy Development Services for Emergency Protective Services, uh, Jared Riley, uh, the Bylaw Review Specialist who led the policy work on this file for Emergency Protective Services, David Weiss, who is the Program Manager for Zoning uh, and Interpretation Unit of uh, PIDE, Marika, Marika Atfield, the Planner that led the development of zoning, uh, the Zoning Report and Amendments. To begin, I'll now turn the presentation over to Valerie. Uh, Ms. Bielto? Thank you, Ms. Gibbons. Next slide, please. Thank you, Chairs. Today, we're seeking approval for a new short-term regulations in Ottawa to address short-term rental hosts, platforms, and property managers. As stated, the goals of these regulations are twofold. Firstly, the regulations permit short-term rentals where it makes sense to do so, while preventing and mitigating the negative community impacts that can result from unregulated short-term rentals, particularly in residential areas. Secondly, the regulations protect housing inventory for long-term residential use by requiring that the short-term rentals only occur in the host principal residence in residential areas. Notre but aujourd'hui est de faire approuver les nouvelles mesures réglementaires pour la location à court terme d'Ottawa. Il y a deux objectifs. There are two objectives to these regulations. First, 
We want to authorize the short-term rental where it is logical to do so while uh, preventing public nuisances that can happen if there's no regulations. On the other hand, the regulation will protect the housing stock, long-term housing stock, by requiring that short-term rentals in residential zone be allowed only for the principal residences. Municipal accommodation tax. These amendments would update and align the terminology with new regulations and would also require short term rental platforms to collect the 4% mat on behalf of hosts in much the same way as the hotels uh, currently do. To administer, implement, and enforce the new regulations, staff also recommend six temporary positions for bylaw and regulatory services. These positions would be funded on a complete cost recovery basis from the suggested permit and registration fees and from MAT revenue collected from short-term rental guests. The planning report that planning staff will speak to recommends new definitions for the zoning bylaw to address short-term rentals and also includes recommendations for temporary use permissions to allow short-term rentals of residential dwellings. I'd like to turn the presentation over to Ms. Atfield from planning to present the planning related amendments first. Next slide, please. Thank you, Valerie, and uh, good morning, Madam Chair. The zoning bylaw amendment that you have in front of you is to facilitate the short-term rental bylaw, of course, uh, with a key planning interest being the protection of long-term housing supply. So we've developed provisions for various forms of short-term accommodation with the understanding that short-term accommodation is not a residential use of land. It is a commercial use of land and therefore will be regulated as such. By short-term accommodation, we mean any unit that is rented for less than a one month period. So with that in mind, I will note three new definitions that uh, are being proposed. The first is a short-term rental, and that is the temporary rental of a unit that is otherwise a long-term principal residence. This use will be permitted in dwelling units and oversized dwelling units across the city, with the exception of zones that explicitly prohibit uh, bed and breakfast use. The second definition is uh, to refer to the temporary rental of a unit that is not a principal residence. And we've termed that a cottage rental. This type of commercial short-term rental will be permitted in dwelling units and secondary dwelling units, um, only in select rural zones where there may be greater opportunity for mitigation of land use impacts. And lastly, we are revising the definition of hotel to clarify its distinct nature as a multi-unit accommodation, and that will be regulated independently from short-term rental of residential units. Uh, these permissions will be provided through a temporary use bylaw, so three-year period, and this is in order to allow opportunity for data collection and to address any impacts observed over the trial period, particularly, again, with respect to long-term housing availability and affordability. Um, so I will now return the floor to Valerie to discuss uh, more details about the short-term rental bylaw. Thank you. Next slide, please. Oh, no, sorry, we're on the right slide. Um, the cornerstone of the recommended short-term rental bylaw is a new permit system and rules for local short-term rental hosts based on council's approved framework of 2019. Staff are recommending the creation of a local host permit uh, for a fee of $110 for a two-year term. As reported in November of 2019, maintaining low costs for hosts is important to ensure that the regulated system remains uh, affordable and accessible for the occasional short-term rental hosts. Higher fees tend to advantage the dedicated short-term rentals that take away from long-term housing supply. To that end, the recommended bylaw would restrict short-term rentals to one zone principal residence, as previously mentioned, in residential zones, both in the urban area and in rural, vi in rural villages where housing supply is a concern. Investment properties or commercial short-term rentals will continue to be prohibited in residential areas with new enforcement tools being introduced to address illicit rentals. 
Le règlement recommandé restreindrait l'allocation à court terme. The recommended rule will limit the short-term rental to the principal residence of a host in an urban residential zone and in a rural village. Short-term rent commercial rentals will remain forbidden in residential zones. There will be new implementation tools adopted to uh, so to avoid any illicit rental. Recommending a companion cottage rental permit as described by Ms. Atfield, also for $110 for a two year term. These regulations will apply citywide with a few notable exceptions. Staff have recommended that short term rental permits would not be issued in areas where bed and breakfast use has already been prohibited by previous council decisions. And a map of these particular areas is included in the planning report. In the case of any commercial short-term rentals having legally established in zones where hotels are already permitted, the proposed regulations would still require these owners to get a host permit and follow most of the bylaws uh, regulations other than the principal residence requirement. In addition to introducing host permits, the bylaw also includes regulations for property managers. And these are the individuals or companies that operate short-term rentals on behalf of a short-term rental host. In particular, staff anticipate that there will be a role for these businesses in terms of managing cottage rentals and looking after properties for snowbirds and other travelers. Staff are recommending that property managers be required to register with the city at a cost of $200 annually. Property managers would have to keep the city informed about which properties they're managing at any given time. And if there's a problem at a short-term rental property during a rental period, they would have to attend within two hours of receiving a phone call or an email from bylaws requesting them to do so. The short-term short -term rental platforms would also be regulated by our proposed bylaw and would have to register with the city for a one-time cost of between $1,000 and $5,000, depending on the number of listings they have with the city. All platforms would be required to provide data to the city about their listings, similar to what is currently required for private transportation companies. Platforms would have to ensure all short-term rental listings include both the city's permit number, as well as the maximum guest limit established by the city. And they would also have to remove non uh, listings for non-compliant short-term rentals when directed to do so by bylaw and regulatory services. As noted earlier, short-term rentals platforms will also be required to collect the municipal accommodation tax on behalf of hosts and paid by short-term rental guests. Staff are not recommending any increase to the MAT, uh, to the current MAT rate of 4%. As directed by council in 2019, staff have reviewed the MAT revenues with uh, financial uh, services department staff, as well as projected expenses and determined that an increase is not required to provide cost recovery for this program and these new regulations. As such, the recommended amendments to the bylaw for the municipal accommodation tax are limited to updating terminology and the requirement for platforms to collect this tax on behalf of hosts. The final measure recommended by staff is a separate registration uh, process for condominiums, landlords, and housing cooperatives to prevent the issuance of a short-term rental permit on those properties where these entities have already prohibited short-term rental use in accordance with their own laws and their own governing documents. Next slide, please. Le règlement recommandé met l'accent sur la responsabilité des autres. The bylaw puts the emphasis on the responsibility of others. On top of getting a permit, the host will be able to advertise on registered platforms only. The permit number will have to uh, be shown on every ad. In addition to getting a permit, hosts would be required to only list on platforms that have registered with the city. All listings would have to include both the city issued permit number and the permitted number of overnight guests. The bylaw recommends a maximum overnight occupancy of two adults per sleeping room with children under 12 counting as half an adult. Regular dwellings would be allowed to have up to four sleeping rooms or eight adults. Oversized dwelling would be able to have up to eight sleeping rooms or 16 adults maximum. 
all sleeping rooms would have to meet existing property standard requirements. At the time of application, bylaw and regulatory services would examine the floor plan submitted by the permit applicant in order to ensure compliance and to conform and to confirm the eligible number of sleeping rules for each property in question, up to the maximum number. At any time, the director of bylaw and regulatory services would be able to reduce the permitted number of overnight guests to address any problems occurring with a particular property or any safety concerns. By requiring the permitted number of overnight guests to be listed on all platform listings, the bylaw aims to prevent the advertisement of what's known as party houses. Maximum occupancy standards in the property standards bylaw would also be applied in order to prevent overcrowding during the rental period outside of nighttime occupancy. Offenses have been created in the proposed regulations to address parties where overcrowding occurs beyond the maximum allowable limit of persons. Should repeated violations of occupancy standards occur, the regulations provide that the host could also face enforcement action, including a fine or action taken against the host's permit. Hosts would be required to inform their guests about the rules for noise, smoking and vaping, legal parking, and waste disposal, with the aim of helping guests manage their stay and preventing nuisance issues from occurring in the first place. Again, any significant or reoccurring issues of non-compliance can result in restrictions on the host permit, including suspension or revocation on a case-by-case -case basis. Les hôtes devraient informer leurs invités des règles concernant le bruit, l'usage de produits à, de fumée the et... The rules on noise, on smoking, the legal parking, and waste disposal should be made clear to the guests. Any recurring non-compliance could lead to the suspension of the permit. standards for short-term rental properties and also requires hosts to maintain appropriate liability insurance. Next slide, please. In summary, staff are seeking concurrent approval for the short-term rental bylaw, the six temporary positions for bylaw and regulatory services to administer and enforce the regulations, and the supporting um, amendments to the zoning bylaw and the MAP bylaw. Upon approval, Staff would use a phased implementation approach, beginning with the registration of platforms and registration of prohibitions by condos, landlords, and housing co-ops. Then, bylaw and regulatory services would begin accepting host permit and property manager applications. Once the city starts issuing permits, and over time, bylaw staff will begin to enforce the new regulations on a case-by-case -case basis, including identification and investigation of non-compliant short-term rentals with an initial emphasis on education and compliance as required. Implementation of the regulations will be supported by an education and communications campaign on Ottawa.ca and in the, throughout the city's social media so that residents, hosts, platforms, and property managers are fully informed about where short-term rentals can occur, what the rules are, and how to report any problems or suspected violations. So chairs, this concludes the staff presentations. Um, Please to answer your questions and thank you for your time. Merci, uh, Monsieur le Président et Madame la Présidente. Thank you very much, chairs. We're ready to accept questions. Uh, we do have two motions uh, that I'm aware of. If we can have staff uh, place them up on the screen and I will introduce them now. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go uh, to the therefore be it resolved. Prior to consideration uh, by the Joint Committee and Council, the language in the discussion section of the report uh, under the last paragraph of the subsection principal residence requirement, page 12 of the report is posted on the agenda, be changed from as a result of the above, staff rec recommend that the principal resident requirement is an integral part of Ottawa's regulatory regime. And so this is this is supported by McLaren Municipal uh, Consulting's final report, which noted that, and then the quote that you see us see before you on the screen, uh, to as a result of the above, staff uh, recommend 
the, uh, that the principal residence requirement is an integral part of Ottawa's regulatory regime. This requirement has been adopted in other jurisdictions where concerns exist about short-term rental use and availability of housing supply, as noted in the McLaren Municipal Consulting Final Report. So it's the first and the Sarah? second. Yep, yeah, please go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm unable to read it. It's very blurry. Oh, I don't know if that, I don't know if uh, that's the case for other people. Here's that a little bit better. That that's a bit better. It's still blurry though. Yeah, it's still it's still blurry, Chair. Okay, if we can ensure that uh, that the joint committee members are provided with these, I think they may have already have been. But if we can have uh, the clerk just send them out once uh, once more so that everybody has it in front of them. So this one, uh, the second motion, therefore be it resolved, the report be amended to include the following recommendation. That the Community and Protective Services Committee and Planning Committee approve the consultation details section of this report. Be included as part of the brief explanation in the summary of written and oral submissions to be prepared by the office of the clerk and submitted to council in the report entitled Summary of Oral and Written Public Submissions for Items Subject to the Planning Act, Explanation Requirements, and that City Council meeting uh, on at the City Council meeting of April 28th, 2021, subject to submissions received between the publication of this report and the time of council decision. So ensuring that we are able um, to receive those public comments. Do we have any other motions uh, to come to the floor prior to moving on to public delegations? Seeing none, our first public delegation today is Michael Crockett, President and CEO of Ottawa Tourism. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have uh, Mr. Crockett with us? Thank you. Okay, Mr. Crockett, uh, no stranger to either of these committees. Please uh, go ahead uh, for five minutes. Great, thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour. Uh, Ottawa Tourism supports the recommendations in the short-term rental bylaw report. Uh, we echo city staff's view that there will be benefits for our community's long-term housing supply for reducing community nuisance stemming from unregulated, unregulated activity uh, and from leveling the short-term accommodation playing field. From a tourism perspective, of course, we promote Ottawa's diverse neighborhoods and the stories that visitors tell about their experiences in those parts of the city. We also know today that visitors are looking for a variety of accommodation options when they travel. And the recommendations set out in this report will ensure that short-term accommodations can play a role in preserving the identity and the vibrancy of the neighborhoods in which they're located. So our organization, we exist to serve the community and to drive economic impact for the benefit of local businesses and residents. And that's why we support the, the common sense initiatives proposed in this report. These recommendations really, really do strike that balance of offering accommodation options that visitors expect while also preserving our community. The tourism industry's post-pandemic recovery is going to be a long one, as you know. It's gonna be measured in years, not months. Uh, our recent forecasts indicate that tourism demand might not reach 2019 levels again until 2025. So this means that our city has plenty of existing accommodation capacity to handle the anticipated demand during this period, uh, during this pilot program as well, which also makes it exactly the right time to move forward with this. So we agree with the recommendation as well that an increase in the percentage of the municipal accommodation tax is not required at this time. Uh, we, we do acknowledge that might mean slightly less mat revenue to, to Ottawa Tourism's uh, sales and marketing activities in the short term in order to cover the enforcement costs for the city. But we believe that during the period of this pilot, that gap will close and incremental mat revenue generated by hotels and regulated operations will more than offset the enforcement costs. And finally, I'll express our gratitude to city staff that have led this initiative. Uh, they've engaged with our organization since the very early days, considering on how to move forward with short-term rentals. And thank you today for hearing from Ottawa Tourism and for engaging with us throughout this process. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Moving on uh, to questions to our delegation. I've got uh, Councillor Fleury for five. Please go ahead. Merci, uh, Councillor Lulaf. Uh, good morning, Thank Michael. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thank you for uh, ongoing work for you and, and the sector. I know you've been on a number of uh, discussion panels and engaged with your, your members throughout this period, uh, specifically just on the mat tax component, because that's something that I, I, I raised in, in reviewing the report. Um, can you maybe remind us what was the mat pre-COVID uh, that was going to Ottawa Tourism? The amount? Yeah, so somewhere in, in, the, in the 2019 year, it was somewhere around uh, 16 million. 
And uh, if, if we remove the COVID buffer um, with the impacts of the short-term rental, has is, is that been kind of a, 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 you were talking about the potential future of reviewing the mat and the impacts of that, but what, what would be the impact if we were to just use that figure, the 16 million, how much do you figure you'd lose uh, to Ottawa tourism? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question, Councillor. Do you mean how much wit would be going towards enforcement, or how much would be going towards uh, how, much, how much would be generated by short-term rentals? No, I'll be asking staff later relating to the mat impacts of enforcement around finding a way to cap it and, and limit it so that we don't shortchange the the Ottawa tourism investment. So, but but have you done some analysis of what would be the percentage impact to uh, your transfers? Uh, if you mean the amount that they, they would be going to enforcement from uh, from the MAT, it's go based on the 2019 numbers, it'd be a very small uh, percentage. So it would be, you know, uh, just doing the rough math in my head, uh, five less than five percent probably. Okay. Thank you for that. So you're not you're not overly concerned, but it is something to 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 keep on the radar in coming years. Yeah, I mean, would would we would we rather there was a different way to have it to have the cost covered? Sure. Um, but, but that's not realistic in, in the environment that we're in right now too. And it's better to take this action now so that, uh, when we so that we have the right regulatory environment as we're coming into recovery of our, of our sector, as we're building back the tourism sector. And, and we're partners in this, right? I mean, we're partners in yeah. that agreement. So it's, uh, it, it, we're, we wanna be good partners and sometimes that means some, some give and take too. I agree and thank you for that. Thank you, uh, those are all my questions to uh, the delegation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, any further questions uh, for a delegation? Seeing none, our second delegation today is Steve Ball, President of Ottawa Gatineau Hotel Association. Steve, if you're with us, yes, I see you there. Great. Uh, we have you for five. Please go ahead. Uh, great. Thank you. Good morning. And, uh, and again, thanks for giving me a few minutes to speak to you today on this topic. The timing of this decision today couldn't be more important. Uh, you may not be aware, but Ottawa will be one of the last jurisdictions in Canada to implement a regulatory framework for short-term rentals. Uh, but the good news is uh, we have the benefit of hindsight as to what others have done before us and what has worked and what has not worked. Uh, it was very commendable that the city took the necessary time to draft a plan that was fair and that was equitable and that engaged with a variety of stakeholders to hear all of the perspectives. I want to take this minute to thank Valerie and Jared and the rest of the city team that worked on this file. Uh, the process was thorough, it was inclusive, and we were very pleased to be included in the process. Uh, I would suggest that at this stage, there really should be no pushback by any groups at, at this moment. So the hotels I represent, uh, along with Airbnb, which is, which is a publicly traded company now, have been uh, severely impacted by the, by the pandemic because of border restrictions and travel bans. Uh, hotels have seen their business plummet to record lows. Over 10% of our local hotel room inventory is now permanently left the market. So it's well over a thousand rooms. And several hotels uh, remain closed, uh, waiting for some signs of, uh, of recovery. Uh, the, the hardest thing to report is about 80% of our staff uh, have been laid off. So we're not alone. Uh, I looked last night at the AirDNA data and it shows that Airbnb is currently listing about 1,754 active rentals. And they're primarily in the Byward market in Lower Town. Uh, this figure is down considerably uh, over pre-pandemic uh, times, but it has held fairly steady over the past year. And, and so that for me would assume that most of these unit, units are likely commercial rentals. Uh, where the host does not live on site. So as we come out of the pandemic, short-term rental companies will be encouraging more people to pursue hosting as an attractive and profitable business opportunity. You already see heavy investment in TV commercials by Airbnb and, and Expedia promoting travel and the use of short-term rentals uh, for accommodation. These ads are also designed to attract hosting for those that wanna consider this. I'm not, I'm not uh, criticizing this form of marketing because the platforms need to build back their business or their host inventory to grow revenues and enhance their value proposition for their shareholder. Of course, this promotion is also what drives investors to buy up properties for commercial use on short-term rental sites. 
And this is ultimately what has been proven uh, to be the best revenue generations for the platforms and, and the biggest problem for cities to deal with. So this is why enacting clear and concise short-term rental regulations in Ottawa has never been more important and never been timelier. It is critical as we head towards recovery from the pandemic and before tourism returns to Ottawa, that city staff have the time to build out their teams and prepare for execution of these regulations. Hosts that choose to use short-term rental platforms now and in the future need to have a regulatory framework to reference and should be compelled by law to comply with these rules that have been so carefully crafted by your staff. I don't know exactly how long it'll take the hotel industry to recover because there's so many variables, but the hotels I serve have lost millions of dollars in the last year. They're gonna lose millions more in the next year. And I wanna remind you that every empty hotel room equates to an empty restaurant seat, one last ticket at the NAC or a museum and an unbought souvenir. In closing, I would say that travelers don't visit a destination to stay in a hotel or, or in an Airbnb. They travel to experience the great things the city has to offer. Ottawa tourism is locked and loaded and ready to go when the restrictions are lifted and we need tourism to recover. Accommodations won't assist much in our recovery as people rarely travel to stay in a hotel or an Airbnb, so don't, so don't buy that argument. Sure, you need a great place to stay once you decide to come, but that's a secondary decision. What we really need today from you is a leveling of the playing field and a clear understanding of what short-term rental rules are. Experience across Canada and around the world has proven time and time again that once short-term rental rules are enacted, they will need to be dutifully enforced for the preservation of our community. This is why our industry, our industry unanimously agreed to support the city and these regulations. So I would ask you today to support these regulations and help us to rebuild tourism back as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Fleury uh, heard uh, a couple of his neighbourhoods mentioned there. Uh, so go ahead, Councillor, with your questions. Monsieur, uh, Monsieur le Président, comme vous savez... Uh, Mr. Chair? As you know, on avait plus de, we were having more than 600 locations per night in my neighborhood. So I'm very happy about the report today. Your engagement, you've been uh, obviously at the table advocating for uh, the membership for, for now a number of years, and your, your comments are, are well reflected. I'm going to maybe bring you to a different perspective in the report. Um, one of your elements since day one has been fairness and um, and uh, some some leveling of equality in, in the process. So the MAT tax appears to be one of those elements. But the second one that's maybe not properly captured, and I'll have questions for staff later, relates to uh, commercial property taxes. So your members are paying commercial property taxes. Currently in the report, I've, I've not seen references to uh, additional property tax requirements for those who will uh, be licensed. I, I'd love to hear from you uh, on, on that specific element. Thank you, Councillor. So, yes, you know, we've advocated, you know, knowing that I've got a natural bias, bias we've advocated for fairness right from the get go. And you'll often hear uh, those that use Airbnb uh, when they travel that they save a few bucks. So, our industry. Um, you know, based on our regulatory requirements, our licensing requirements, um, you, you know, we have to download these costs to the guests. So just, just by its very nature, hotels are ultimately going to be more expensive than Airbnbs. So if you take property taxes, for example, um, you know, from a commercial perspective, um, you know, they're, they're substantial, they're fixed costs, and they're particularly hard um, at this time. Uh, I'll, I'll, candidly, I, I was speaking to Ross at the Westin yesterday. His gross revenue in April won't even cover his property tax installment that's due. And I know these are unique times and property taxes are necessary for the functioning of the city. But the big frustration our industry has is when, and, and people always default to the savings or the little extra, bit, you know, a little bit cheaper to use an Airbnb because of the, the you know, the fixed costs that they don't have to spend, including commercial property taxes. 
why should somebody operate a business and still be taxed at a residential level? So it just seems like it's something that should be addressed. And, and ultimately, we're, we're talking to the province about perhaps a hybrid, whereby if you do run a com commercial uh, business out of your residence, there should be a hybrid tax uh, there to create some fairness and equity. I appreciate uh, that. I'll, absolutely. I'll be asking uh, the, uh, the report writers those questions uh, a little later. So thank you for, for that. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Fleury. Our next delegation uh, is Cheryl Parrott from the Hindenburg Community Association. Hi, Cheryl. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. This is a great day. Um, so the Hindenburg Community Association fully supports the staff recommendations um, for the short-term rentals and really well done, congratulations, bravo, any other word that fits. It's, it's really fabulous to see this. It was a long, hard process um, of meetings and, and uh, stuff to get to this place, but well done. <clears throat> and it is a good time. I echo the previous speaker's comments. It's a great time for it to come forward uh, before travel opens up um, and the restrictions ease. And I was quite shocked in the report to see the number of um, uh, rental nights in 2020, as well as uh, that there's uh, in the report, it said 1500 listings uh, available on just two of the platforms in February. And um, that's a lot of rental units that could permanently house people, <clears throat> excuse me. So we urge you to move ahead quickly. Um, there's just one concern. Um, we've been told that uh, we must accept lots of density and I appreciate uh, um, Chair Harder's comments about um, uh, Kitch Sippy Ward. Um, but yeah, we're told people need a place to live so we need to accept that high density. But the new high rise buildings that have been built in this, this area um, all advertise furnished apartments for short and long-term stay. And some of them uh, did state a provision of a minimum 30-day stay, but others don't mention those. Um, some of these are just in residential zones, not in mixed use or commercial zones where hotels would be a permitted use. So we hope that bylaw will monitor these rental platforms to ensure that the minimum 30-day stay is being adhered to. And it's not just empty wording in the ad that's then just disregarded and it becomes really a short-term rental. So enforcement, follow-up and sanctions are really key to this being effective legislation. So well done and thank you so much for moving ahead on this. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Leeper, please go ahead. Thank you very much and uh, uh, colleagues, the uh, Hindenburg Community Association is facing issues around Airbnbs and, and short term rentals, both to do with the removal of significant housing stock uh, from the market, uh, which is something that none of us want, uh, as well as party houses and their endorsement of the short term rental rules that are in front of us today, I think should give us all a lot of comfort that the uh, issues are being addressed and they're being addressed meaningfully. Um, so Cheryl, thank Thank you very much for, for coming out to express uh, the HCA's support. Um, I would just like to ask staff uh, when it comes to uh, that time to let us know how that 30 day limit uh, will be will be proactively monitored um, so that we know that people who are advertising that it's a minimum 30 days uh, aren't able to let that slip without uh, getting caught somehow. So um, thank you very much, uh, Cheryl, for coming out today. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks so much, Council Lieber. Our, our next uh, delegate is Nathan Rotman, um, Public Policy for Airbnb. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, members of Council. Thanks for hearing from us today on um, this very important matter. Uh, first, on behalf of our community, I'd like to thank the Council for its thoughtful leadership during these difficult times. I also want to commend the City Administration for its consultative approach on short-term rentals over the last few months. As we begin to see hope on the horizon and attention turns to the future, it's important to consider how travel and tourism can play a vital role in Ottawa's economic recovery. In particular, there is a tremendous opportunity to, for individuals to leverage their homes, their most expensive and valuable asset to earn extra income. 
This is particularly important as in 2019, 52% of our hosts said that they host because it helps them make ends meet. Furthermore, as restaurants, attractions, and small businesses have struggled during the pandemic, Ottawa Council can take steps to support economic recovery for the community and for small businesses while bolstering government revenues with small changes to the short-term rental framework. With so many people and small businesses suffering during the pandemic, this is not the time to consider additional restrictions on short-term rentals. We encourage Ottawa to plan for its recovery by delaying the implementation of this bylaw at least until winter of 2022. Our data shows that Canadians are very eager to travel again when it is safe to do so. The anticipated post-pandemic travel is a significant opportunity for tourism destinations like Ottawa, and limiting your supply of short-term rentals just before the reintroduction of travel is a mistake which will limit restaurant, small business, and attraction recovery, which is sorely needed. While we encourage you to, to delay the implementation of the bylaw, we have some specific comments on the report draft in front of you today. On compliance, if this bylaw is passed, like in Toronto, Airbnb will work with city administration to educate and engage our host community on their obligations under the bylaw. This will involve the creation of a mandatory license field where hosts will have to enter the city approved license before being eligible to continue listing their short term rental on the platform. However, in Toronto, where Airbnb is the only licensed platform, other platforms have continued to operate without being licensed with the city. We encourage the city to immediately begin discussions with other platforms to ensure compliance or risk failure with the bylaw. We've also discussed the draft bylaw with city administration and have offered to use our new city portal to support the city with real-time access to listings, data, and our compliance tool. Through the city portal, bylaw officials will be able to see each active Airbnb listing and request the removal of non-compliant listings in the city with the click of a mouse. On taxes, in Ottawa, we are proud to have partnered with the city to collect the municipal accommodation tax on, beha tax on behalf of our host community on a voluntary basis. The voluntary collection agreement in place since 2018 has benefited the city treasury with almost $2 million in just 2019 and 2020. We do have a number of specific concerns with the language in the bylaw. In Toronto and in most other jurisdictions, Airbnb has agreements to remove listings within seven business days. While working with other jurisdictions to improve seven day processing times, we have no reason to believe a three day requirement is in any way feasible and ask that section eight be amended as such. While we can commit to removing listings with which pose an immediate health or safety risk within 24 hours, regular data sharing and the creation of the mandatory license field should significantly reduce the enforcement burden on the city and we would request a seven day notice period for listing removals. We also believe that the draft bylaw creates unnecessary red tape and friction for host registration in section 13. The requirement for landlord consent is unnecessary and should be left to a host who is a tenant to discuss this matter with their landlord. This is a private matter and doesn't require the engagement of city hall. We also oppose the, the requirement uh, for a host to support, apply a floor plan as indicated in the draft bylaw. These kinds of requirements are unnecessary, only create confusion, confusion and additional paperwork for hosts while providing the city administration only with additional work and no useful information to support compliance or enforcement. Finally, we ask the city that the city reconsider its restriction of short-term rentals to primary residences. This policy will restrict the parents of a university student from short-term renting their secondary unit or basement unit when their child is away at school. It will stop those with a secondary suite whose parents are snowbirds from using their occasional home as a path to economic security and important income. For those who are counting on this policy to serve as a pathway to solving the city's housing crisis, I can assure you that looking to the regulation of home sharing to achieve this objective will leave you disappointed. In Vancouver, which put in place a similar primary residence restriction, the city reported that 2,000 short-term rentals uh, were removed from the policy uh, from the city when the policy came into place, yet the city saw only an increase of 300 long-term rental units. While the data in Toronto is not readily available yet, according to one study of the housing market, rental prices remained static from January to February of 2021, following the removal of thousands of short-term rental units in the city. We believe that home sharing can be a force for good in neighborhoods by creating economic opportunity for everyone, That's not it. just those fortunate enough to own a home in increasingly expensive cities. And we'll continue to support <laughs> policies that make that possible, uh, if possible for people to share their homes. Thank you Thanks. very much. Happy to answer any questions. Great. Um, we will not be re reconsidering that matter today, uh, but uh, questions uh, for questions and stuff, we've got uh, Riley Brockington. Please go ahead, Councilor Brockington. Thank you, Chair, uh, and good morning to you, and thank you, uh, Mr. Um, 
Rotman, for your presentation. Um, I am not going to, you know, debate or argue with you. There are, there are merits to having short-term rentals. There's utility. Um, I think that's going to be acknowledged today, and there needs to be ground rules associated with how we accommodate this in our city, given that's been wild west up to today. I, I just want to remind you, we are here today because Airbnb, Airbnb has failed to address how their houses have been misused over time. That's why we're here, because there have been bad apples, corporate bad apples in the community that have failed to address party houses, that have failed to address illegal activity in these houses and property standard issues. And it's councillors who have heard for years from their communities about issues that have not been addressed by companies like Airbnb. Airbnb. That's why we're here. And you had a colleague come to us over a year ago when we were considering asking staff to do this, speaking against this. And it's because of these issues that Airbnb has not addressed historically that we had to come here and create laws because companies like yours didn't address this. So um, I think it was important for me to say that today. I certainly welcome your comments, but we're here because your company has not been able to work with cities like Ottawa to address these legacy issues. Uh, thank you for your comments, Councillor. Um, well, I appreciate that there are always some, some that there are, are from time to time, there are challenges with guests or with hosts on the platform. We've taken significant steps to remove uh, and reduce the instances of nuisances on our platform. Uh, first, we have a high risk reservation review where we review the listing, uh, the uh, guests who um, review the reservations of, of certain guests who, who may be uh, trying to book a reservation for the first time. We have banned all parties and events on our platform and hosts or guests will be removed from the platform for breaking those rules. And finally, in January of 2020, uh, of 2020 we banned anyone who is 25 years of age or younger from booking a reservation close to their home in order to, to prevent um, uh, parties and nuisances in our, in our listing. So we're continuing to advance our uh, processes every day to make sure that our community and the communities that we operate in are safe. Um, we also have something called the uh, neighbor tool at airbnb.com slash neighbors, where neighbors can, can let us know if there's a nuisance, if there's garbage, if there's an event happening in real time, uh, and so that we can take action. That website both has an online portal for, for making complaints, but also has a 24-7 phone line where you can call to let us know about an instance in, uh, in progress uh, so we can take action. But uh, I appreciate your comments. And, uh, and I would also just remind councillors that we are not the only platform. There are many platforms operating in this space, uh, many platforms that are much less responsible on these matters. Uh, I know I've heard, uh, my colleagues have heard from councillors uh, on this council. Uh, with regard to nuisances and we immediately investigate and take action with our hosts uh, or with our guests when uh, when we receive those complaints. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Bernard, please, for five. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. Hi, Nathan. Uh, good to see you here. Um, I just, I, I wanted to extend on Councilor Brockington's questions, not so much on the individual issues that, that he was pointing out and that you responded to, but more so, more broadly in the city. And I guess I'm a bit surprised that there's not some acknowledgement of uh, making these these legal in your comments, because at, to this point, um, you know, to clarify, Airbnbs operating outside of a principal residence have always been against uh, the zoning and residential zones in Ottawa. And um, the interpretation has been explicitly uh, made to this committee uh, previously and that the city has had trouble enforcing its, its existing zoning rules, which is one of the primary reasons for the underpinning of these proposed uh, reforms. And um, one that was undertaken, I guess, with consultation um, throughout this process. And so I guess I'm surprised there's not some acknowledgement in your comments about the positivity of the proposed regulations extend the legality of Airbnbs and residential zones by changing that zoning to allow for hosts uh, to rent their principal residence through Airbnb, even when they're out of town uh, for snowbirds, for example. Um, and essentially before now, only Airbnbs run in, in a similar fashion to traditional bed and breakfasts were clearly permittable in Ottawa. This is going to change with this report. So I'm wondering what your comments are on, on that piece of this. Uh, thanks, Councillor. Sorry, I had to cut my comments a little bit uh, to, to fill in. Uh, the, 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 I, I recognize that there are two bylaws that we're discussing today, and I was focused on the uh, on the um, 
licensing bylaw, but we, we do support the, the zoning bylaw. And I think that the city also made a very smart decision with not limiting uh, to primary residences in the rural areas where there are opportunities, additional opportunities for the city to benefit from an economic development perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, we have uh, Councillor uh, Carolyn Meehan. Please go ahead, Councillor Meehan. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Mr. Altman, uh, just some clarification on some of the comments that may, you made during your presentation. You said that in Vancouver, after they brought in the bylaws, that uh, the, um, I guess the, the uh, number of units that were current were uh, rented out did not resort back to um, uh, housing stock. Only a fraction of them did. Uh, can you tell me what happened to the units, uh, the, uh, the bulk of the units? Uh, good morning, Councillor. Uh, sorry, I, I'm not aware of what actually happened to those units in particular. Uh, I was on a panel uh, time is all questionable these days. Sometime, <laughs> sometime in the in the in the past, uh, with the director of licensing from the city of Vancouver, who had a slide uh, with a study that with a, that the city had done that showed uh, you know when we had removed about two thousand units that the three hundred had moved only three hundred had moved to the long term housing market. I think when we talk to our hosts, uh, what we hear from them is they use their homes for different reasons throughout the year. And some of them can put their home on the market on a, on a long-term basis and some cannot because they use it for their child, for their parents, for whatever other purposes, uh, for extended family who are coming to visit in better times. So not every short-term rental unit that leaves Airbnb from the short-term rental platform uh, will make its way onto the long-term housing market. Uh, some will just be used for, for other purposes and it will just limit the economic uh, uh, impact and the, the earning potential of those individuals who, who had a basement apartment that they could maybe rent out 10 months a year or eight months a year, uh, as opposed to someone who can do it full time. And so I, I don't understand why having a bylaw, I mean, there's, just, there's no regulations, everybody's renting it out. You have regulation and then they stop renting. Um, I just, I don't follow, but um, I, I thank you for you know, providing the insight you could. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Kavanaugh, please, for five. Thank you. Hi, Nathan. Nice to see you. Um, I'm, I'm puzzled by um, the request to to stall on this when we've put so much time into this, and as well as the fact that um, you've been consulted as an organization as well as other organizations. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around why we would stall this process as you suggest just uh, thanks so much, Councillor, for the question. Uh, our, our real suggestion around stalling is just that there is an, a, a tremendous, people are suffering right now during the pandemic and that people need to, to earn back some income that they have lost throughout this period of time. And the, the travel boom that is expected following uh, the, uh, the rising of uh, travel restrictions could significantly benefit both people in Ottawa as well as the restaurants and small businesses that have struggled for the last year and a bit. Uh, through the pandemic time, and that would be the reason we would suggest uh, the delay. We've had fantastic, uh, uh, very collaborative meetings with the city uh, for many months and uh, do appreciate very much the, uh, the hard work of the uh, city administration and our, uh, our ongoing uh, discussions with them. Thank you. I guess we'll have to disagree because I think this is an ideal time since uh, things are low right now um, to get things uh, implemented so that we're ready for that season because it's still going to exist. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Our next uh, delegation that we have today with us is Tony Miller, President of the Ottawa Small Landlord Association. Welcome, Tony. Please go ahead for five minutes. Morning, everybody. Glad to be here. Uh, I have a few uh, slides to share. Thank you, Melody. Um, next slide, please. My name is uh, Tony Miller. I'm the president of the Small Landlords, uh, sorry, the Ottawa Small Landlord Association. We have about 1,600 members. Uh, some of our members do focus on short-term rentals. Next slide, please. Uh, before I begin, just want a big shout out to Jared Riley, Val Valerie Bielo, and Jennifer, Jennifer Hesketh for, for meeting with us and allowing us to speak. Uh, meet with them during the stakeholder meetings, very professional and uh, really appreciate their help during this process. Next slide, please. Just a quick update. Uh, 
since about the beginning of the pandemic, there's been roughly from the province and from the city of Ottawa, uh, let's say 10 or so rental housing regulations or bylaws that have been studied or implemented. So I just wanted to, to pass that along. That's quite a few. Next slide, please. Uh, overall, I'm not here to oppose the bylaw. I just want to provide the input from a small landlord lens. And we think that the bylaw will do what it set out to do, what it sets out to do. It, it, it should definitely take care of the parking, the garbage, the, the nuisances that happen. And, uh, and rightly so. Uh, nobody wants to, to live in places or areas where these things are happening. It'll come down to enforcement, of course. Uh, we think that the, the two things that I don't think that the bylaw will actually fix, so to speak, or, or help very much will be the rental vacancy rates and the housing affordability uh, that was mentioned, that were mentioned in the consultant's report. Next slide, please. Uh, the consultant's report just said that there were, uh, at the time, 1,236 units. And just this slide just points to how long um, or what kind of impact those units would have if all of them were converted to long-term rentals. So not a huge impact. So Councillor Meehan asked a really good question. What happened to the short-term rentals in Vancouver? I can't speak to what happened in Vancouver, but in Ottawa, uh, what is likely to happen and what has happened to date so far, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, some will be converted to long-term rentals for sure, and some already have. Uh, many of them have been converted to medium-term rentals. So over 60 days and let's say up to four, five, six months. And it's because of new construction delays, healthcare workers, uh, self-isolation, people who need them for self-isolation periods, uh, home sales when there's gaps in closing dates, and diplomatic relocations. Uh, we believe some will be sold because of the economics, the numbers don't work for investors, and because many do not want to return to the long-term rental market because of the delays at the landlord and tenant board. Some will remain short-term rentals and comply. Some will remain in short-term rentals and not comply. So hopefully that answers Councillor Meehan's um, uh, questions earlier. Uh, while we appreciate the overall goals of the bylaw, uh, we just have a couple of concerns we just wanted to, uh, to point out. The definition of principal residence ex excludes corporations. Um, many small landlords purchase properties under corporations and move into the homes. It's just part of their overall plans and goals. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Also, as mentioned in the, in the short-term rental consultants report, a key reason why small landlords turn to short-term rentals is because of the landlord and tenant board, the delays at the landlord and tenant board in particular. There are significant delays there. So short-term rentals could still be attractive to individuals who will not comply with the bylaw because of those delays and the lack of legal recourse at the LTV. Uh, we'll go to D. Uh, Osla supports the ability to register prohibitions against rental properties so that renters won't be given host permits if not desired by the owners. Thank you very much for that. That is very helpful. Uh, I'd just like to point out, however, that tenants who choose to rent out units or rooms as short-term rentals typically do so without landlord's consent or knowledge. So the, the pre, that clause or the, the prohibition put in there by the city doesn't help small landlords when tenants don't comply. Next slide, please. Here's an example of that from an Osla member who has a tenant and uh, he stopped paying and he, she found out that he moved out and he's renting uh, to six people in a one bedroom for 45 bucks a night, 45 bucks per person and there are six people living. That's, that's your time, uh, Tony. A few, Sorry. Uh, just, a, just a quick second to wrap up there. And, I didn't uh, hear the one minute time. Sorry. Okay, uh, Councillor Fleury with, uh, with questions to our delegation, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Tony, just a point of clarification, when I read the report, uh, and I'll be, um, I don't know, Mr. Chair, if it's appropriate, but my understanding is if a landlord does not want a tenant to do short-term rental, uh, it is completely possible you can, uh, you can block, you can 
red circle the municipal address. And I believe that if you're a tenant, you have to prove um, uh, landlord compliance prior to getting a license permit. So, Mr. Chair, based on the information pri provided by the delegate, could we get staff? Is it appropriate to get staff clarification on those elements? If it'll help you with your question, uh, we'll allow it. Uh, please uh, go ahead, uh, Valerie, if you'd like to make a brief uh, statement on that. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, the councillor is correct. We're going to be addressing this issue both at the front end of the process and at the end of the process. So in order to get a short-term rental host permit, any tenant would have to, as part of their application package, provide consent from their landlord in order to get the host permit. In addition, we are going to be, we are recommending that registration process that Mr. Miller uh, referred to where landlords can proactively register with the city their prohibitions that they might have in place. That would effectively block any future permits from being issued for those prohibited properties. Thank you very much. Before you can continue with your questions to the delegate. You know what, I, I'm happy with those clarifications. I think Tony will be as well. Okay, I appreciate that. Any further questions for this delegation? Seeing none. Okay, so up next we have uh, Nicole Robinson uh, and afterwards uh, Heather Pearl. So if you want to get rather ready to Heather. Uh, so Nicole is an articling student with the uh, Davidson Hull Allen LLP uh, in condominium law. So please uh, welcome to the committee, Nicole, and please go ahead for five minutes. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Yes, that's right. I'm with uh, Davidson Hull Allen and we are a condominium law firm. I'm an articling student. So I'm here to speak to a couple of uh, concerns respecting condominiums and short-term rentals, namely that um, we wanted it to be clear that condominiums will continue to have authority to regulate uh, short-term rentals in their communities, and also that they'll continue to have flexibility in regulating. So first, uh, with respect to their authority, um, we suggested a provision be included in the bylaw respecting um, short-term rentals in condominiums, and specifically that they may still be prohibited or regulated by the governing documents of the condominium. So their declaration bylaws or rules. And this would, we hope, avoid any confusion or disputes arising during this pilot project um, respecting jurisdiction over short-term rentals in condominiums. And second, um, with respect to flexibility in regulation. Uh, so right now we've seen condominiums that prohibit or permit um, short-term rentals in their communities, but we also see some creative approaches. So they'll permit them, but with certain restrictions. For example, they're permitted, but only one per year or a certain number of short-term rentals per year. So with this separate licensing process or permit process for condominiums, uh, our hope is that they'll be able to continue in those flexible approaches as well, and not just either prohibit or permit them in their communities. And those are my submissions for today. And if I'm happy to answer any questions, if you have any, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Brockington, please for five. Thanks chair. And thank you, uh, Ms. Robinson. I, I just, you are uh, an attorney or a lawyer specializing in condo act law. Is that correct? Sorry, I'm an articling student. Okay. I do work under lawyers that specialize in condo. Thank you, sorry. Um, I have a number of condos uh, in my ward, and, and this was something that came up when we were discussing this in 2019. I just want to make sure I understand correctly. A condo can pass a bylaw that outlines its rules, its law with respect to short-term rentals. It could prohibit them. And should a, a short-term rental exist within their corporation or property, they can take action against that. But they can also um, register with the city and have the city enforce the law and have the city spend the time and money and energy to go after a property owner in this case. So why would a condo spend all that time and money and try and enforce it themselves under their own bylaw when they can use the city to do it? I'm just trying to see what's in the best interest of the condo. Oh, thank you for your question. So I think that for condominiums that have a vast array of considerations unique to their own communities, they want to maintain that sort of autonomy and flexibility in regulating and enforcing in their community. Not to say they wouldn't appreciate having something 
like a city um, regulation to rely on um, in enforcing their bylaws. But I think that uh, the concern is without having the flexibility independent for each condo, they won't be able to make those rules as flexibly as they can right now and enforce them in their neighborhoods, in their communities. I completely agree with you on the point about being flexible. I don't want it, the, uh, the rules to be, you know, handcuffed condos and their ability to make decisions. I will follow up with staff because I do want further clarification when we get to questions for staff about uh, their thoughts on how a condo corporation should go forward. I know it's touched upon in the report, but I thank you for your presentation today. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, our final delegation today is Heather Pearl. She's the co-chair of the Champlain Park Community Association. Uh, are you with us, Heather? I do see you there. Hi. Great. Please yeah. go ahead for five minutes and welcome to the committee. Thanks. Hi. Uh, first, I'm really glad to see this. It's desperately needed. Um, as a community that uh, spent two years dealing with a ghost hotel, we were very happy to see this, this happening. My approach is always from the public safety perspective. And uh, so basically my suggestions are for uh, some tightening up in places. For instance, uh, definition of principal residence for short-term rental purposes could be further defined as uh, that the residents owned by the person rather than you know delegated to some to a renter because you do have uh, issues. I've been calling these things disaggregated disaggregated hotels because uh, you have so many uh, or did have so many sort of shady people in the background with multiple properties renting them out without any control. And I do also note that it was entirely illegal for them to do so, has been since forever, and they were doing it anyway. Um, as far as the number of bedrooms allowed, I, I would like to have them limited to three, just as it is right now in uh, the permitted uses for residential areas for R1s through R4s, which I know are gonna disappear. But at the same time, if you have a maximum of three guest bedrooms, you have a greater deal of control over uh, the numbers of people who show up. All of those people drive cars and communities are not set up to, uh, to, take, uh, to handle that kind of parking. You could end up with basically a, a, an extra large dwelling with eight bedrooms having 16 people coming in. And that just doesn't seem to work in a residential area. Um, it would be really good if principal residents, <coughs> excuse me, who are traveling or are not on site when the residence is rented to ensure that their neighbors have a contact so that uh, we can respond immediately if something goes wrong. In the case of ours, it, uh, we actually prevented the entire place being trashed maybe burned down anything. It was, it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in a party in a, a small house. And it took us a long time to get people to come from the city and eventually the police. So uh, the other thing is, can the number of days be capped for principal residents to do short-term rentals? Because basically, they shouldn't be doing it full time. And uh, if, if we, we, we could have them sliding around the rules, the, the owners sliding around the rules, if uh, they're allowed to just do it full time. So I'm really in favor of a cap. I've suggested a maximum of 90 days for consideration. And I kind of like the idea that uh, people who are running commercial operations in residential areas also should be paying higher property taxes because that they're, they're benefiting from something that was, that was never previously allowed. Um, basically that's it, it's, uh, it's a great effort and I really appreciate this. It took us two years to get rid of the one in our neighborhood. And 
the young couple that moved in when the place was finally sold to a real person, they discovered that they didn't even have uh, the option of, a, of contractual uh, repairs to the damages that were left to them. So, I mean, this, this group abused the neighbors and it abused the new owners whom we are really happy to see. So that's, that's really it. Glad to see it. Think it could be a little bit tightened up in a couple of places and that would be awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pearl. We really appreciate you coming out and making your delegation today. We do have a question uh, from Councillor Leeper. Please go ahead. Thanks, uh, Heather. Thank you very much for uh, the general support. And I, I, I absolutely hear the uh, points that you're looking for. There will be a period, obviously, um, uh, of testing this and the opportunity to close up loopholes uh, down the road. Uh, and I know that you and others will be watching that very carefully. Um, I'm just curious, assuming that this passes in roughly the uh, form that it is right now, is it um, easily understood by uh, folks like yourself, community leaders, are you going to be able to communicate to um, the residents in a very tight knit neighborhood uh, what these rules mean and, and what they can keep an eye out for? Uh, or are there any materials from the city um, that you feel might need to be done in order to ensure that there's no ambiguity? Our problem always is that people don't pay attention to things until it's right next door to them. So I can put stuff on my website, but uh, I, I can try to do some kind of a, a blast to everybody, but that's one off. So I will be doing those kinds of things. But as, as I said, I, I don't know what else could be done. I think it needs to be a, a very, very public on the website. I think that uh, it just needs to be very clearly laid out what is and what isn't allowed. And maybe on the first page, point form, simple language. And then the next thing I will be doing will be ensuring that everybody gets it multiple times, reminders, et cetera, to try to ensure that, uh, that we get, the, get everybody to understand what's going on. So some of those fundamental uh, or foundational communications products from the city are going to be... Yeah, uh, and, and be it should be simple. It should be really, really clear, and it should be easily accessible to everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to the end of our delegations today. So we'll move on uh, to questions for staff. So please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. We see a couple of people chiming in here now. That's great. Uh, we will begin today with Councillor Deans. Please go ahead for five minutes, Councillor. Thank you, um, Councillor Luloff. Uh, just a comment and then a question. Um, this has been a long time coming. I recall when I was the chair of CPS many years ago, um, and with the advent, I guess, of Airbnb and the problems that we had back then. And at the time, you couldn't reach Airbnb. And you certainly could never get them to drop anybody from their platform. And I remember um, um, suggesting out loud at a committee meeting one day that uh, we might have to bring in a bylaw to address this. And that was the first time I heard from Airbnb after I said that out loud. And I remember saying to the woman that called me, what would it take? Take to get you to drop somebody from your platform because I had people throwing beer bottles over the neighbor's fences and cigarette butts. I had lines of backpacks, buses coming into the neighborhood. It was garbage strewn everywhere, parking issues. It was awful. And uh, it was not what our neighborhoods expected. And uh, when people that didn't live in a neighborhood were allowed just to have a free for all, it was not working. So this has been a long time coming. I remember council supported the amount of money that we needed to do the background studies to get us where we are today. And I am grateful uh, that we have come this far. And I think even the threat of a bylaw has actually helped a lot um, to bring us to where we are today. So I'm, I, I, I wanna thank everyone for the work that they've done on this. I think they've done a really good job and I like that it's a three year period so that we can tweak it at the end. Um, the one thing that I 
worry about and I don't really agree with and I would like to see an amendment if uh, the committee members would be agreeable to it is around the number of bedrooms and the, the size of the dwelling units. I don't I agree with the speaker Heather that uh, just spoke and talked about oversized dwelling units. Um, Eight bedrooms is excessive. And uh, in some of the re uh, residential areas that I represent, there are large homes and they have built multiple bedrooms in the basements. And under the definitions in this bylaw, you could have up to 16 adults or 32 children or some combination thereof. And that to me is not a resident, it's not in keeping with the residential area. It will still bring in the sports groups. It'll still bring in the bus loads of people. It will still be very disruptive in a neighborhood. And I don't think that we need to have that many people allowed in one dwelling unit, even from a safety perspective, it sounds uh, way too much for me. So I guess my question to city staff is, why did you decide to go with dwelling units and oversized dwelling units? And why didn't you just call them a dwelling unit? And as Heather had suggested when she spoke, limit the number of bedroom uses to three or perhaps four. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have looked very carefully at the occupancy standards that we're recommending and looked at what's happened in other jurisdictions. Um, limiting occupancy standards for the purposes of short-term rentals by sleeping room seems to be a common practice uh, in other municipalities, but also through platforms. Um, so we know that in Ottawa, there are a small number of listings for um, number of guests over uh, eight people. So we need to recognize that and accommodate, staff's perspective is that to reasonably accommodate those uh, demands for larger group rentals up to an absolute maximum of 16 uh, will help compliance in the regulated environment that we're proposing. So again, um, what we're proposing is that this occupancy fit within the overall permit regime, of course, where there has to be emergency contacts, where if there's a property manager, they have to uh, attend the property within uh, two hours to deal with those solid waste or property standards matters that may be occurring over the rental period. So we know, for example, that the platforms that the three platforms that we have been consulting with have uh, put rules in place along the lines of the occupancy standards that staff are recommending. Two currently are limiting the maximum occupancy to 16 and one is limiting it to 14. Um, again, the occupancy standards reflect what is currently permissible in residential dwellings uh, and also reflect what is permissible within the property standards bylaw up to the caps that staff are proposing. Um, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Jared, to um, give committee members an idea of where the listings fall right now in Ottawa for uh, four bedrooms or less or eight bedrooms or less. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you, Chair. Uh, according to the AirDNA data that we have from March of 2021, uh, there's currently, there's about 236 listings that would fall for uh, between six to eight people. And there's 105 listings uh, for eight uh, or more people. And uh, collectively, they uh, were booked uh, just over 2,700 nights uh, during the month of March. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's quite a high demand for this activity. It represents 13 to 14%. Uh, of total listings. And I know that uh, party houses tend to attract a, a lot of council's attention because they do cause a lot of disruption. Uh, it's also important to note that, that this is most commonly for traveling families. Uh, uh, you know, we wanted to build some flexibility for, for a family that was traveling. Uh, and uh, we see that there is, is quite a demand for this. So the concern is if we make it too restrictive, 
where is that demand going to go? Is it going to generate more illicit rentals or discourage compliance? Uh, so we wanted to be flexible up front uh, to accommodate as many different styles of traveler as we could uh, with the understanding that if at any time uh, during that permit period, uh, if problems do emerge, the bylaw has the ability to restrict that occupancy further at that specific address. Okay, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but it does seem excessive in a single family dwelling unit to allow that many people. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna stand down, let the other committee members uh, hear what they have to say, and maybe we could, there's nothing to prevent us from changing that number, moving it downward, if that was the will of the committee or council, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, up next, we have uh, Vice Chair Egli, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, just a, a couple of questions. So first of all, in, during the staff presentation, it was indicated that areas of the city that, that currently do not allow air, uh, bed and breakfast will also not allow uh, this sort of short-term short rental. And I'm, I'm wondering, I'm assuming you simply transferred whatever the policy reason was for not allowing bed and breakfast in those neighborhoods or communities through to short-term rentals. But for those at home who may think that the committee's not doing enough necessarily because we're still going to we're going to actually legalize short-term rentals and allow them in the vast majority of our communities, I'm wondering if staff could explain the rationale why certain parts of the city are going to be treated differently than others why the vast majority of the city is going to have short-term rentals legalized and there will be portions of the city uh, where it won't be allowed at all. So I'm wondering for those listening in the public and the committee, if staff can explain the rationale for making that kind of exemption. Uh, yes, Ms. Mr. Chair, perhaps I can um, start off by explaining the rationale in terms of the permit regime that's proposed and then turn it over to planning colleagues to speak about those uh, previous council decisions on bed and breakfast specifically. So from a permit perspective, um, the use of property as a bed and breakfast and the use of property as a short-term rental are very, very similar. They're practically identical, particularly when these short-term rentals are being listed on a platform. The, the listings resemble each other. Um, they provide the same gamut of services. So from a permit perspective, it doesn't make sense to allow short-term rentals where bed and breakfast have already been prohibited by council. It would be very difficult to try to untangle and distinguish both uses if we were to al allow short-term rentals, but <laughs> continue to respect council's decision to prohibit bed and breakfast in those particular pockets of the city. So um, the permit regime is proposing to respect those previous council decisions of prohibiting bed and breakfast use in certain areas of the city by not allowing short-term rental permits to be issued in those areas either. In terms of those particular um, council decisions, uh, Mr. Chair, I would turn it over to my planning colleagues to give you some history on that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the main concern that we have here is that uh, we did have a number of uh, historical sites uh, located across the city where bed and breakfasts have been prohibited uh, for various reasons. Uh, the most notable one would be the one, uh, uh, the area uh, that prohibits uh, bed and breakfasts within Rockcliffe Park. Uh, the main issue with that one is that there's an existing secondary plan for Rockcliffe Park uh, that has prohibited commercial uses. Uh, and because this is a temporary zoning measure and it is a pilot project, uh, staff did not uh, have the mandate to uh, open up that secondary plan or really engage in a fundamental reinterpretation of what that might mean. Uh, it is a three-year temporary project, so there is opportunity to, uh, to revisit that and look into that going forward. Uh, plus, also, that's also something that we would uh, want to look at uh, through the new zoning bylaw rewrite as to whether those things are, are truly uh, applicable going forward. The other areas where there are existing prohibitions are in certain rural areas as well. 
uh, where uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, again, going back to uh, historical reasons, uh, bed and breakfast has been, uh, has been limited in some of those areas. And again, because this is a temporary pilot project, staff didn't feel that, uh, that uh, it was really uh, a, a good use of our uh, resources at this time to reopen some of those old issues. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we wouldn't uh, examine those uh, in uh, the next update of the, uh, of the zoning bylaw, and also if these measures are made permanent. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I, you know, I think we're one city now. We've been one city for a long time, and and uh, you know, we we should have similar rules throughout the city. I think um, so. I'm glad that it can be uh, revisited and monitored during during the uh, the pilot piece. I want to go to one of the comments that uh, the last delegation made which was around number of days a principal residence can be utilized for short-term rental and the fact that to her understanding there's no cap uh, on that so i'd like clarification on that and and further that if there is no cap how is it my personal uh, principal and personal residence if i'm renting it out 365 days a year i'd, I'd like to understand that if that's the case Thank you, Councillor, and uh, through the chair, uh, we looked very closely at uh, uh, at a day cap or a nightly rental cap uh, as part of phase one of uh, of this study, uh, and we looked at multiple jurisdictions uh, uh, who have regulated short term rentals, uh, including places like San Francisco, who are among the first regulators, uh, and what we had seen is is that the a nightly cap can be very hard to enforce and does not achieve the same desired outcome uh, that a principal residence requirement does. Uh, for example, uh, you see a lot of people who will list uh, on a platform for their 60, 90 day cap. They'll shut down the listing. They'll create a new one that makes it look like a totally different listing and then repost. Uh, so it becomes very hard to post that or uh, to enforce that. Uh, whereas with the principal residence requirement, we provide, uh, we require the evidence up front. Uh, uh, they have to sign the declaration. They have to prove that it's their principal residence at the start. Uh, and the bylaw gives uh, bylaw officers the power to request additional documentation uh, to verify principal residency at any time during the permitted period. Uh, so this is an approach uh, that we have seen in uh, Vancouver. I think Vancouver is the model that our framework uh, is most closely similar to, uh, and they have received, they have achieved some very positive results uh, using this model. So it's basically, it's just easier to enforce through the principal residence program, um, principal residence requirement, than it is to uh, enforce uh, principal residence through a nightly rental cap. Oh, and I appreciate it would be difficult to enforce. I guess my, my difficulty is it seems to be a very loose or broad definition of what a principal residence is. If I can use that as an income generating property 365 days a year, to me, that's simply not a principal residence. Um, so, so I have some concerns about that. It sounds like staff is not open to looking at some kind of a cap. Um, and, uh, but it just seems to me that that, that, that that's a very broad definition of, of what a principal residence is. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave that point at that. Um, what's to stop me on a principal residence to register a home as a principal residence? Um, and, well, actually, no, I'm not even gonna go there because without the cap, it doesn't matter. If, if it's my principal residence, I. It sounds like I don't actually have to live in my principal residence, or am I missing something? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, as Jared has said, uh, proving the principal residence requirement will be one of the key elements of permit issuance. So um, not only will we require uh, permit applicants to sign a declaration that it is their principal residence, and the definition essentially says this is their home, this is where they receive taxation information, insurance information, uh, where you know, they'll have to, to show bylaws a piece of government ID, such as a driver's license or an equivalent piece of ID, to show that for the purposes of this jurisdiction, this is their principal residence. 
Um, yeah, we, we have also required them, uh, the bylaw says that you can only have one principal residence. So, um, sorry, you can only have one, what, sorry? One principal residence. So that means that uh, through the data that uh, the city will be obtaining from platforms and through independent data scraping and web surveillance capacity that bylaw and regulatory services will have, uh, they will be able to tell if a host uh, has applied for more than one residence in Ottawa. Uh, other oh, than the, co the cottage rental exemption, um, hosts will only be allowed to have one host permit for their principal residence in Ottawa. I appreciate that, but I, I guess in the scenario I'm thinking of, Riley can own a home, never live in it, live somewhere else and claim the home that he doesn't live in, because that doesn't seem to be part of our definition, as his principal residence and rent it out 365 days a year without any supervision. Or am I missing something? You're not asking for an affidavit or certification that I actually reside in this home. You're saying I get mail there, I get my tax information there, I insure it, uh, but it appears there's no requirement that I actually live there or I'm part of that community in, in any real way. Or am I, or am I missing something? Uh Thank you for the opportunity to clarify, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, the declaration will require the permit uh, applicant to uh, say that they meet all aspects of the definition of principal residence, so that this is essentially their home, that this is where they live, um, and that they will abide by the regulations of the host regime. Okay. So, so I go back, and I'm not, I'm not trying to belabor this, but I go back to my original point. If I sign a declaration saying this is my home and this is where I live, how do I then rent? How do I then rent it out without cap, 365 days a year if it's my home and where I live? Well, we don't anticipate that that will occur. Quite frankly, um, we are proposing to open up uh, the zoning rules to allow flexibility for local hosts, so that they can avail themselves of the opportunity to rent their their principal residence either when they're there, as is currently permitted under the bed and breakfast model, or when they're not there. So we want to create flexibility for the snowbirds or for people who wish to rent out their principal residence when they're away for a week or during long weekends. Uh, this is a fundamental um, piece of our proposed regime to create more flexibility for compliant hosts within the regulated environment that we're proposing with the checks and balances that we're proposing and the regulations. So I, I'm going to ask if staff can do something between now and council. Uh, I think it was Jared referenced that you're following the Vancouver model in this regard. I'm wondering if, if information could be circulated in, in particularly how you relied or, or what you relied upon in the Vancouver model or bylaw and regulations that, that Jared has indicated has been so successful in, in, in dealing with this issue. I think that would be helpful before the final vote uh, in terms of whether there, there should be a cap or there shouldn't be a cap. Um, I, it, it, I sound like I'm critical, but in general, I do want to thank you very much for doing this. Now, my community in particular has struggled with this. We've had a number of issues, including a shooting into a neighboring, a neighboring home. Uh, so I, I really do appreciate staff's efforts in this regard. Um, and so, you know, I've asked some tough questions. I appreciate that, but, but uh, the work was important. It needed to be done, and I think it will provide some protections. I'm just worried about some of those issues around capping, uh, as, as Councillor Dean's raised as well, about capping the number of rooms in use and the number of days that it can be used. But perhaps we can sort that out between now and, uh, and, and Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. If the committee will indulge me just for a brief moment, because it does pertain to, to, to this line of questioning. I'm just wondering uh, if, if staff can answer this. Uh, is there anything stopping me from, from you know, renting out my home on Airbnb, this is my principal residence. You know, I receive my mail here. This is where I live. Buying a fifth wheel, taking it down south in the winter time, uh, living uh, in a trailer park in Texas, and then driving back up uh, in the summertime and staying out at Long Island in in my in my trailer, uh, which which a lot of uh, retirees do, and continuing to rent out my principal residence uh, uh, as an Airbnb, uh, three hundred and sixty five days of the year while I come pick up my mail on the weekends and that sort of thing. There, um, no, there's nothing in our bylaw that would prevent you from doing that. We don't 
anticipate there will be a lot of circumstances where that may arise. However, in the, in the example that you give, uh, you as the host permit holder will be accountable for all the rental periods that occur in your principal residence when you're there and when you're not there. That means that you'll have to give emergency contacts to bylaw uh, so that if there is uh, a situation that arises during the rental period, you will be responsible for answering to bylaw or your property manager will. If there is continued non-compliance or issues of public health and safety, bylaw has the flexibility to take immediate action either on your permit by imposing conditions or revoking or suspending your permit in addition to fines. You will have to inform your guests about the applicable rules during the rental period, including noise, garbage, and parking. Uh, so there, we have built in a, a robust system of accountability for the local host, whether the local host is there or not there. I appreciate that clarification. Thanks uh, to the committee for your indulgence. Uh, moving on uh, to our the rest of our questions to staff from committee members. First, uh, uh, Councillor Brockington, please go ahead. Thanks, dear. Here, here's the problem. It's the term short-term rental. At City Hall, short-term rentals define the period at which one renter can rent for up to 30 days. But the community thinks that house on my street will only be used intermittently on a short-term basis for the purpose of rentals. It's two different things. We are raising expectations that we're gonna have a bylaw that's gonna control and even cap, even though there is no cap, the use of these houses for short-term rentals. And so here's the issue. If we allow a home on a street to be used more than six months a year, more than 50%, how can that then be a principal residence? I'm not gonna be there. I'm gonna be somewhere else. So if you have these cash cow homes that are being rented out all year, maybe to 12 different renters for, six, for 30 day periods, <clears throat> it's, it conforms to the bylaw, but you're gonna have this ongoing issue in the communities there'll be greater controls because the bylaw is gonna put some, some rules and regulations there, but we're still gonna have the revolving door of people going through these homes. There should be a cap. As I think about this and hear more of my colleagues talk, we, we need to cap the number of nights in any given year, the unit can be rented out for this purpose. And so I think the maximum would be 180, that's six months. Six months minus one day would then allow the owner to be there for 50% plus one day to live there in their principal residence and then use it for less than that. I, I don't have anyone coming to me in my community that says, yeah, we want short-term rental units rented out all year long. Airbnb pitches, well, it's a way to have extra pocket change now and then. Oh, Canada Day is coming. You can you can go out and, and make your home available for a long weekend. Uh, I, I I just I'm worried about the expectation versus in reality what's going to happen. So I think we have to give some serious consideration to capping it at 90 days, which I think would be fair, up to three months. But the very maximum would be six months minus a day, and that way you don't have that the primary residence issue coming in. So again, I, I don't want to make changes on the fly because I'm not prepared to move a motion now. I, I want to get that out there that I do think we need to cap the number of nights in a given year that a unit is on the market. Um, just some questions from constituents that I have. Um, first of all, the six new bylaw officers that are being assigned to that, how did you come up with the number six? And in the first 12 to 18 months, do you think that's going to be enough? I have a feeling they're going to be very busy. How did you come up with six? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chair, I would uh, turn this question over to the Director of Bylaw and Regulatory Services. Thank you. Welcome, Roger. Good morning. I apologize. I was uh, on a phone call and I missed the question. Could you uh, ask the question again? Sure. Just the six new officers are being assigned for, I guess, surveillance and enforcement. How did you come up with six? 
and is that enough? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good question. I mean, it, it was um, it was a long discussion about uh, you know any time that there's new regulations that come into effect, we always see an increase in in call volume, and we were concerned about that. But we also see that you know during you know the first year and into the second year, we see a bit of a a tail off in in calls as in, with uh, and also using the the proactive model. So when we're using proactive enforcement, we often see that um, it's less onerous on enforcement efforts. So uh, we really do feel that the the six enforcement staff uh, coupled with the um, uh, surveillance uh, uh, software that we're also procuring um, will will be sufficient for for the enforcement of these regulations. If I refuse to get a permit, if I refuse to register through the city, I continue to operate. I don't want to pay the fee. I just don't want to go through. The, that is something that uh, Mr. Chapman, through you, um, is something that you will investigate and enforce, right? It is a mandatory requirement for property owners to register through the city. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, that's correct. Okay. So to staff, at the end of the three years, how do we claim success? What will success look like for us? What has to happen for this pilot to be successful? Explain what you envision. Mr. Chair, uh, during the three-year term of this pilot, staff will be reviewing um, service requests, enforcement data, the data that we have for permit uptake, registration uptake, feedback that we have from short-term rental uh, hosts and platforms, um, the interactions with platforms and property managers, among the other myriad of people that we'll be uh, dealing with, uh, to get a sense of whether, first of all, the proposed regulations are achieving the goal of uh, mitigating uh, and, pro and uh, preventing community nuisances that occur from unregulated short-term rentals, and then trying to determine what impact these regulations have on the availability of long-term housing. So at the, uh, what staff anticipate is reporting back to committee and council prior to the three-year mark to give committee and council a good picture of what the regulations have achieved. What success looks like is that we have uh, a good amount of compliant local short-term rental hosts that have availed themselves of the flexibility we're offering them for their principal residents that they have taken accountability for the rental periods, that they're working well with platforms, and that they have all the information they need to make the rental period successful. 30 seconds, my friend. Thanks, Chair. Um, my last question, just on condos, I was having trouble articulating this with the art articling student, but a condo, a co-op, other property with a property manager, would it not be in their best interest to also register through the city if they wanted restrictions instead of doing it on their own? Can you elaborate for me? Yes, I believe it would be, Mr. Chair. And in fact, that is why we have created this recommended prohibition uh, system. So um, during phase one of this work, we heard from some condo corporations and some landlords that um, despite their own governance rules, they were having difficulty dealing with either their tenants or their condo owners who were um, conducting short-term rentals on their premises. So what we're offering them is a type of protection where they can come to the city and proactively register their own governance documents that prohibit short-term rentals. In the face of that registration, the city will not issue a short-term rental permit for those addresses. So what happens then? Uh, if someone applies for a permit for one of those prohibited addresses, they won't get one. If enforce investigation and enforcement show that there is actually short-term rental activity on those premises, those hosts will be subject to sanctions under the bylaw, including fines. If the activity uh, continues, they will be subject to escalating fines for continued non-compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, <laughs> the intent of short-term rentals is not to rent 365 days a year. So I, I do think we need to look at this. I'd like to listen to what my colleague said. Um, but again, community expectations are not that it's a 365 day enterprise. Uh, thanks, Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, Conseil Fleury, à vous la parole. 
Merci beaucoup, M. le Président. Puis je vais débuter avec. I will start with congratulations to the whole team. We all often hear one city, one team. It's a great example of cooperation here, especially Jared and Valérie, who've been there since the beginning. Legal non-conforming that sort of bridges existing uh, situations, and then the overall hotel zoning, which would be a permission under short-term use. Can you, that's sort of put aside, but it, it is central, like because anywhere where a hotel use would be permitted, someone could buy a property, uh, it, trigger that use, and and convert the all the units into a short-term rental. From what I understand other than what was just described by Councillor Brockington as your primary residence. Can we maybe get a, a bit of a deeper understanding on the impacts of the components of nonconformity and hotel uh, zoning permissions? Mr. Chair, I would uh, refer that question to uh, staff from planning or legal services. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, I'll start off and then if planning wishes to add, uh, there are uh, zones within the city in part 10 of the zoning bylaw uh, that in addition to allow, they're mixed use zones. So in addition to allowing uh, what we would consider the standard residential uses, uh, they also allow hotels. Uh, and therefore uh, it would be uh, quite possible for someone who is operating a short-term rental uh, to uh, claim an entitlement uh, to continue with that use after the passage of the proposed zoning bylaw and regulatory bylaw as a legal non-conforming use. Uh, and pursuant to the Planning Act, uh, subsection 34.9, this is not a right uh, that the City of Ottawa can take away. Okay, and then with, oh, I got feedback, sir, if it's my mic. Um, I So with that in mind, with the proposal for the, the short term, the temporary zoning bylaw today, uh, couldn't anyone make that case in the future? I just want to understand how both of those conditions don't lead us to allowing hotel uses anywhere and everywhere. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, uh, the, uh, the one of the essential elements of a temporary zoning bylaw, the first is that it can only last for a maximum of three years. Uh, but the second and, and very important in this context uh, is that it does not give rise to a legal non-conforming use. It is the very essence uh, of a temporary zoning bylaw, uh, evident in its name, uh, that it is for a limited time period uh, and at the expiration of that time period, uh, the right to such use expires. Uh, there is no legal non-conforming right that approves from having benefited from a temporary use zoning bylaw. And could someone make a case that if they were uh, they were short-term rental that uh, could they move to get a, 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 a permitted use for a hotel in a residential environment under what you're describing? Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, uh, it is always an option that's open to um, anyone within the city of Ottawa uh, to apply for permanent zoning. Uh, and so uh, someone who had had a temporary use in the past uh, could pay the requisite fee, uh, do the requisite studies, uh, and apply for permanent zoning. That is a theoretical option, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair. Do we have in our official plan or the future official plan some uh, context to where hotels are desirable? I'd, I would pass that to planning, Madam, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Madam Chair uh, and Mr. Chair, the um, uh, the, the zoning for these areas is quite clear. These areas are residential in, in nature. Uh, principal commercial uses are not something that we would generally look upon favorably within a residential context. Uh, and uh, that is also affirmed in the current official plan as well, that residential uh, neighborhoods are primarily for residential uses. Uh, as Mr. Mark said, uh, if a, an application came forward, the planning department would be obligated to review it uh, but that uh, review would be on the basis of uh, adherence and consistency with the official plan and also uh, with the provincial policy statement as well. 
I appreciate that. Thank you, David, for clarifying, and thank you for your work on this. Um, okay, I have a just a clarification relating to um, uh, the requirements. So, can you, if I'm a condo board, if if my condo board doesn't want short-term rental, what is? I think I'm going back to to Riley's point here. Is there an easy kind of motion that we could have on our books that a a board could pass that would red red zone the address and then same thing with the landlord like i want to understand practically if you're a landlord and your tenant is doing short-term rental how does that work so they don't have we we either revoke a permit or they don't have a permit and they're renting illegally how does that can you maybe speak to both of those aspects yes uh mr chair i'll deal with the condos first um the condominium act of ontario clearly sets out already the ways that a condo board can prohibit certain activities on their premises. There's the condo declaration, there are condo bylaws, and then there are also condo rules. Our proposed bylaw um, will accept any one of those three as valid prohibitions uh, to stop the issuance of a short-term rental permit for those premises. Um, there's lots of information already available through the provincial condo authority on how condo boards can get these measures into place. Uh, there are legal requirements in the legislation uh, for them to do that. And from my perspective, condo boards seem to be very well versed in how to do that. Um, so condo declarations and bylaws are the more formal of the two. Um, the rules is the more relaxed one. So we are allowing rules to be brought forward as evidence of a prohibition on a condo uh, property. Uh, we will work with uh, the representatives of the condo boards to make sure that they provide the information necessary to register that prohibition. Once that prohibition is registered, uh, the city will not issue a short-term rental host permit for that address. If someone tries to undertake short-term rental activity at that prohibited address, uh, through the investigation enforcement tools that Mr. Chapman spoke about, uh, that activity will be found out and will be investigated. The host does that, they are running the risk of fines uh, for illegal activity, unpermitted activity. With respect to the landlords um, that the councillor was asking about, we're proposing a similar process. So any landlord that currently prohibits um, short-term rental activity in their rental properties can come forward as part of that registration process and provide a declaration and evidence of the prohibition. Again, the same thing would happen. Uh, once that registration is in place, no short-term rental permits would be issued for those rental properties. If uh, a tenant tries to obtain a permit, they won't get one. If they are listing for short-term rentals on that prohibited property uh, through the web surveillance tools that Mr. Chapman spoke about, um, those listings will come forward and bylaws will investigate further for non-compliance. The tenant then would be subject to fines as well. We should have one, one final question. It relates to taxes. So I don't know who's best to, to answer. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm looking for your, your guidance on that. Uh, we've got um, Joseph Mahoney with us uh, today on the line. The Deputy City Treasurer will be able to help you uh, with, with questions regard to taxes, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Joseph, thank you for your time today. Um, what would be the implications of a hybrid scenario where I'm, I'm using uh, Councillor Brockington uh, as example and Councillor Eglai's example. If someone was to be on the platform doing short-term rental for 180 days, half of the period is for commercial use. Um, how could we hybrid a commercial tax that reflects the period on the platform? Because I, I'm, I actually agree with uh, the hotel industry and Ottawa tourism on fairness. I think there, there's no, the benefit to the, pro, the city of Ottawa is through property taxes and property taxes use is, uh, is higher for the hotels right now for the commercial. So I wanna understand how we can create a, a fairness element on from property tax components. Um, thank you very much. Um... Mr. Chair, so 
Uh, property taxation in Ontario is uh, very much regulated by the province and subject to uh, the Municipal Act and the Assessment Act. Um, the Municipal uh, Property Assessment Corporation, MPAC, is responsible for assessing and you know, putting properties within the appropriate property tax classes. So uh, in this particular case, if, if a property is being used regularly for um, commercial purposes, such as uh, short-term rentals, uh, that's information that we could uh, forward to MPAC. Uh, and they would have to review that in action that based on the Assessment Act and based on the regulations that support the Assessment Act. Uh, as a city, uh, we are sort of limited in terms of the options that are available to us at this point in time in terms of addressing specifically uh, these properties that are sort of conducting um, short-term rentals uh, in residential properties. However, uh, under the Assessment Act, there could be provisions that are available uh, that MPAC would be able to explore in order to sort of change the uh, tax class as needed. But again, that's not a piece that we would be able to conclusively comment on. We would have to, you know, take these pieces on a case by case basis as they become, uh, as we become aware of them and as they're forwarded to us and make MPAC aware of them for review and action. Okay. Complex. Um, Joseph, maybe you and I can take it offline. And I, I wonder so, if, if other colleagues are interested in joining that conversation, because I I would, let me stake my interest. It would be to bring forward a, a motion to council uh, to gain those authorities. Cause I, I think we have a really robust effort here in, in the report. And I think one of the missing pieces is, is uh, fairness around property taxation, which, which is an interesting component in all of this. Absolutely. So, th so I'll, I'll reach out, Joseph. Thank Absolutely. you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Fleury. Up next, uh, we have uh, Councillor Tierney, please, for uh, five minutes. Please go ahead, Councillor. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question uh, is uh, going to go to uh, Roger Chapman, the Chief Chapman. Um, and uh, before I, I ask the question, I do want to thank uh, our bylaw services. Uh, your world was turned completely upside down, and we forget uh, that you used to just ticket people, ticket cars, and now you have a whole new world that you have to deal with. So please pass along. Uh, my thanks to you and all your staff for the work you've been doing during this pandemic. Um, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, Airbnb situation occurred in my ward uh, where you uh, acted swiftly, uh, but uh, that was in the old world. Uh, can you explain how you dealt with uh, Airbnb uh, to be able to uh, strip, uh, strip that property owner of the ability and luxury of being on their platform versus what the future is with what sounds like it's going to be one click and who would have access to that click. Thank you um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, for sure. It's uh, it's a good question. And it's actually very similar to the process that's um, that's been uh, added to the bylaw. So, I mean, it's a request through Airbnb, Airbnb given that there was uh, you know, a, a criminal element um, and a safety concern. Uh, we made the request through Airbnb and they were immediately removed from the platform. So, and I have to say that um, in, in most of our dealings with uh, Airbnb, when it comes to uh, some of the rental properties um, that the hosts have uh, listed on their platform, uh, when we do have uh, problems, um, as some of the, the council um, members of uh, committee members have stated here today, uh, Airbnb has been very good to deal with in, in getting those properties removed from, from listing from the platform. Excellent. Thank you. And so on that, uh, just from a, I'm thinking, you know, uh, how it would work uh, after this goes through, uh, would that be something like, I'm just trying to think chain of, uh, chain of command wise, obviously you're the top dog in the department. Is, is that where the buck would stop? Is it, would it be you guys having access to that platform to be able to remove them from the platform? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, no. So we would actually do the removal. So it's not um, it's not us. Uh, you know, we, we would make the request, and within forty eight hours, uh, Airbnb has to has to react to that. Okay. And do they have an appeal mechanism, or is it pretty much it's end of the road with this new legislation? There is no appeal mechanism on a on a request like that. It would be uh, it, it would be a fine if um, to to the platform itself. In this case, Airbnb. Uh, if they if they fail to comply with their requests. Great, and thank you. Sorry to make you answer some of the same questions. I just needed this for some of my residents. And again, thanks to Raj, to all you and your staff. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Councillor Journey. Um, up next uh, for committee members, we have uh, Councillor Kavanaugh, please, for five. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you to the team for putting all this work together. This has been a long road and um, I think it's worth it. I, I, I think that uh, we're doing the right thing and I, I appreciate all that's gone into it. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I don't think we were realizing the extent of Airbnbs because they're in residential homes and, and they're kind of stealth and um, until they have a problem. And some of them remain stealth because they're not a problem. And, and uh, I wanna recognize that that many are, are law abiding and are doing well. And I shouldn't use the term Airbnb because that's just one platform. Um, and that's one of my questions is it's reaching out uh, because it's it's not just them, there's, there's others as well. And people can just do it um, on their own. So I just wanted to get to a comment on how uh, we're dialoguing with these, with these different uh, platforms. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, we have actually been consulting throughout the process with three different platforms, Airbnb, Expedia, um, that uh, operates VRBO, that has short-term rentals in Ottawa, and a smaller platform called Mr. b, &B. So we have included them both in the first phase uh, to, for policy development, and in the second phase for development of the bylaw. Uh, we're hopeful that, of course, they will all register and comply in Ottawa in order to give local hosts a choice of platforms to list on. Um, we will make sure that uh, lots of information is available uh, on our website and through social media so that other platforms that may be interested in coming forward and dialoguing about how to register will be able to do that easily. At the end of the day, the web surveillance tool that Mr. Chapman has referred to will let us know what other platforms have short-term listings in Ottawa and have not registered. And uh, they, they will be investigated and addressed on a go-forward basis. Thank you. Um, in terms of condos, um, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's great. We're gonna have a way for them to register for prohibitions. Um, I remember when we were talking about it that there may be instances where there's people on their boards that are the actual people that have uh, are uh, doing short-term rentals, and um, and I don't know how to I don't know what they're going to deal with in terms of that situation. Um, large condos, small condo buildings. Um, is it possible they can, you know, have a situation where um, their board is full of people that do short-term rentals, and therefore it could be allowed? Um, Mr. Chair. That is possible conceivably. Again, it's up to each condo board to avail themselves of their powers under provincial legislation to put into place the declarations, the bylaws or the rules to govern the activity on their premises. City can't do that for them. And I, I would uh, take that step further and say, it's not the city's role to do that. Uh, these are condo boards that represent their members. But if they have made a rule, as I said before, if they have made a rule to prohibit short-term re rental activity on their premises, we hope this registration process will be a simple and cost-effective way for them to block issuance of permits for their properties. Thank you. And um, um, is there a timeline for them to register? Well, if they, you know, just want to make sure they don't get caught short, if we'll, we'll have good communications to help them along. Yes, absolutely. Um, that will be part of the roll up, uh, rollout plan under the direction of Roger Chapman, where there'll be information on Ottawa.ca and through the city's social media channels to uh, phase uh, the implementation. So again, the first emphasis will be on registering platforms so that local hosts have a legal platform on which to register, hopefully more than one, and also to encourage landlords and condos to come forward with any of their existing prohibitions so that we can get that information up front as well. Thank you. Um, one of the issues that, that came up that, that gave um, short-term rentals a really bad name was um, shootings. Um, and, and there was one in, in the downtown area, but it involved a, a resident of mine and it was a youth. and um, I know that it was tackled also by Airbnb in terms of their preventing rentals to, um, to those under 25, but um, are we addressing that as well? Uh, 
Um, Mr. Chair, what we're proposing to do is put accountability on the local hosts. So um, a staff can't tell you that our rules will prevent shootings. Um, and I, I don't expect that that's where the councillor is going with this. But, council, uh, but Chair, what we're doing is creating a permit system so that if there are incidences of public health and safety, there will be measures available for the Director of Bylaw and Regulatory Services to uh, suspend the permit, put, put conditions on the permit, or revoke the permit. Um, and I would defer to Roger Chapman to explain to you how he works. He will work with Ottawa Police on that basis, but the, the permit regime will be able to account for non-compliance and in particular uh, conditions of uh, concern about public health and safety at any rental property. Thank you. Um, if I may, um, the, one, the, the one way we find out about these short-term rentals is from neighbors. We get the complaints. We get phone calls to our office. And um, the usual sign that this isn't a, a typical house is there's a lockbox on the door and um, it's th that's and, and so you know that there's no owner. Um, so I'd like to know what we can advise if there's uh, concerns about that there may be one that's you know in the future once if, if we pass this uh, an illegal short-term rental um, uh, what the telltale signs are because um, they are very still that they're kind of meant to be they kind of that was the whole point of them in the first place. They're going in residential areas, but um, because um, I'm, you know, I, I'd like to make sure that uh, we we have a, a good system in place for when people do their three one one calls on concerns. Mr. Chair, um, I think staff would continue to encourage residents to call three one one if they have any concerns or complaints about short term rentals. Um, that will help. Uh, build the city's database on how these regulations are uh, being understood and being implemented and how successful they are. Uh, in terms of identifying illicit short-term rentals, which I believe that's what the councillor is asking about, yes, um, both the upfront permit registration system as well as the investigative tools that this bylaw will enable will allow bylaw and regulatory services to identify them and then take action against them. Just over a minute left, Councillor. Okay, so if they're a legal one that um, has registered, we, we can go uh, to the host and, uh, um, and speak to them if there's any infractions. And if they're illegal, then, then we can fine them for, for, exi for existing on something they shouldn't have exist on. Is that a, a lengthy process or is that something, like I think that the people would be worried that it would, you know, maybe we're gonna, there's a lot to prove that they were uh, in that situation. Um, how easy is it to, uh, to go after ones that are uh, just doing it on their own, not registering? Mr. Chair, I would refer this question to, uh, to the expert, uh, Roger Chapman. Yes, thank you through, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, these are, again, with our proactive enforcement model um, with the short-term rentals, uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to uh, capture a lot of these um, unregistered um, short-term rental locations um, before the, you know, the, there are any community impacts. Um, but as, um, as Valerie has mentioned, um, I, you know, I would encourage people to continue to call 311 if they see these. Um, we can quickly, uh, those will be uh, given to the enforcement staff to to investigate and we can quickly tell whether they're registered or not uh, in the system. Um, but again, through the proactive enforcement model and the, the surveillance uh, software uh, that we are uh, procuring, we're hoping that we'll be able to um, to bring a, these, um, you know, illegal, uh, illegally operating um, short term rentals on board fairly quickly. Thank you. I think we're off to a great start and I appreciate all the work. Take care. Just to add on to that question, Roger. While we have you, if I'm a if I'm a, a landlord, uh, I, you know, a small landlord, uh, I have a lease with a with a tenant, and that tenant decides without without my permission um, to list uh, my apartment on Airbnb. Um, what what recourse um, does the does the landlord have in that case under this bylaw? 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a good question. Hopefully we catch that one up front. I mean, obviously, um, one of the conditions for uh, the issuance of the permit is that that host have uh, proof or uh, declaration from their uh, landlord or property owner um, that they're permitting the short term rental to occur on their property. Um, so if it's uh, if that host is registered on a short term rental platform uh, without that permission, they should be removed immediately. So it'll be up to the platform to remove this individual from it. Yes, absolutely. They have to. They have to have a permit and a permit number um, before they can uh, before they can register them on their platform. So that should be done up front. Understood. Uh, moving on to the remainder of our committee members before turning it over uh, to our colleagues, uh, we have uh, Councillor Leeper, please, for uh, five minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. A few quick questions, but also just wanted to address this issue of um, uh, the cap that has come up over the course of the meeting. I just want to uh, come back to some fundamentals, which is we haven't identified as a council through the policy process that the number of evenings um, a, a property is rented is a problem that we are trying to deal with. I think what we identified in 2019 is that poorly supervised uh, Airbnbs can be disruptive in a neighborhood. Uh, when when you have absentee homeowners who are essentially making a commercial enterprise out of renting out their residential properties, that needs to be dealt with. And I, I am pleased with the regulatory regime that staff have come up with to deal with that. Uh, and I think we can we can tie ourselves in knots trying to understand what a primary residence is but just for the sake of folks who uh, may be listening in you know a principal residence is being defined in this bylaw um, as where uh, the person is ordinarily resident and makes their home and conducts their daily affairs i I'd urge council to, or I'd urge this committee to be open that that provides a plain language understanding that, you know, somebody has to live somewhere. Um, and, and certainly I can ask legal to uh, weigh in with respect to um, whether or not that definition is is going to be effective or not in terms of how a court might interpret it. But, you know, we've said that you have to live in the house or ordinarily in order to rent it out. And then we've put in place a really strong permitting process such that you have to register in order to be able to rent out your primary residence for um, short-term rental. And then we've put in place really strong enforcement mechanisms that we haven't had previously. So in terms of taking care of the issue that we had uh, decided to address in 2019 of absentee homeowners, irresponsible homeowners, renting out their properties on a commercial basis where those have the potential to create really um, strong disruption. You know, I, I think staff have succeeded in, in following council's intent and giving us a regulatory regime that impacts that. I think to uh, put in place a cap is to say, wait, we have a new policy goal, which is that, you know, we need to limit the number of evenings that residential properties, uh, well-run residential properties are used. So I, uh, you know, I just, I'm happy to, for the next three years, see how this bylaw works in terms of addressing the problems that we have already identified. Um, <laughs> A couple of quick questions though for staff. Uh, so monitoring the 30 day limits, uh, is that something that we need to do proactively? How will we ensure that somebody isn't able to rent an apartment for 32 days or 40 days or 46 days? Uh, Mr. Chair, that is an excellent question. And in fact, the bylaw proposes that uh, to give us the tools to do that proactively. So as part of the registration process with platforms, platforms will have to provide bylaw and regulatory services with regular information on their listings, including the municipal address of the listing and the number of nights for each particular rental period. So bylaw will have the ability to verify the number of nights through that, but also independently through the web surveillance tool that is being procured. Okay. And the bylaw defines a short-term rental now as less than 30 consecutive nights. So they'll be able to see what the exact number of uh, rental nights are for each rental period. 
Great, thank you. Uh, so these are some very welcome tools. Uh, uh, you've heard from a couple of our community associations. They 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 are uh, pleased with the, the new regulations. How uh, how can we help community associations and other community leaders know what the new rules are, uh, so that they're in a position to um, uh, be our partners in ensuring that those are are being obeyed. Mr. Chair, I would suggest that um, as the city is developing uh, its communications campaign uh, through Ottawa.ca, producing materials and guides for hosts, for platforms, and for property managers, um, that perhaps council members could assist by providing those links through your own networks. So I think that's a very helpful suggestion if uh, that the councillor has made. And if councillors are amenable, we can certainly make those links available once they're ready and uh, those counselors that could then um, circulate those within your networks and communities would be very helpful. Thanks, I'll, uh, I'll certainly take that on uh, from, from my end. Uh, coming back to the condos, I think Ms. Robinson was um, asking the city to Sorry, I'm watching some waving. Um, I think the uh, the Ms. Robinson was asking the city to somehow confirm in our municipal bylaw that a provincial statute applies. Um, would would clarification in our bylaw of what the provincial statute means would that have any force in law? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to start answering this question and then uh, pass it over to legal services if necessary. Um, I don't believe it's necessary to clarify in our bylaw that a provincial law applies, particularly the Condominium Act. So um, condo corporations are aware that they have the ability to put condo declarations, condo bylaws or condo rules in place to govern the activities on their properties, including short-term rental activities. What uh, might be helpful, uh, sorry, uh, Councillor, what might be helpful is that we could make this information available as part of the education material that we're developing for the city's website uh, and through social media. And I assume the, um, uh, the correct advice is if you are uncertain as to the applicability of the Condominium Act to, to talk to your lawyer. That is what I'd recommend, yes. Wonderful. Um, those were my questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Oh, okay. Oh, great then. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Councillor McKinney, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks to staff, Valerie, Jared, who um, I met with extensively uh, over, uh, over the last few years. Um, for for uh, for the report in front of us, um, you know, when we got the when we uh, approved the, this framework uh, last year, uh, it was and I've I've told residents this. Um, you know, I've I've looked at many uh, bylaws across certainly North America, and um, and and I, I I honestly believe that that we have today in front of us what will be the the strongest. Uh, uh, regulatory framework for um, short-term rentals and uh, and managing uh, short-term rentals in our, our city. And I just want to, I just, I just have a, a few things. I don't want to, I don't need to speak for long, but I just want to say this that you know, there's there's some discussion about you know afford, the, the the affordable housing stock or the housing stock period, and you know I, I don't know that we can pull up a number and say of the 1200, you know, how many have we, uh, how many have gone on to the long-term uh, rental market? You know, somebody scoffed at the number 300 in Vancouver and uh, somebody else today suggested that, you know, it might only be half of the 1200 or a fraction, but you know, for the people who need housing, I can tell you that 100, 300, 600, 800, it's a lot of housing. It's a lot of people out there who would otherwise not have had rental accommodation. And I can tell you that it's not just what went back on the market, it was stopping the erosion of our rental housing stock. I used to get in my office, and I can go back, I have kept, I have kept record. I used to get, um, at one point I was like once a week, once every couple of weeks, 
a resident, a resident calling me who had lived in the downtown for 15, 20 years, so had affordable rental accommodations as a result, and they were being pushed out. Some were suicidal. They knew there was nowhere else to go. They worked at the local grocery store. They, were, they worked in the service industry. And so the, the affordable rental uh, accommodation that they had, they were losing and they had to move elsewhere, perhaps buy a car. Like they, they weren't gonna be able to, to, to survive. So you know, I caution anyone who you know, thinks saving 300 units is not a big deal. Governments pay a lot of money for us to build 300 new affordable housing units. And between 2010 and 2016, for every one that, the gov- that we built publicly, we lost seven in the private rental market. So it is a big deal. And you know, I'll just say this about uh, you know, the, the issue of, of, of safety and, and, and ghost hotels and, and party houses. You know, I had a, a young person um, who, was, who was murdered in, in, in the ward that I represent in an Airbnb. Uh, it's one example that of many that we've heard from your residents and mine. Um, and it has always been difficult for me from day one to get any of the platforms to act and to act quickly and to shut down party houses and to shut down um, uh, accommodate their hosts um, because this is driven by, by profit and not by public good. And we heard that loud and clear today. So um, again, I do wanna thank staff, thank council. Um, you know, again, the, the, the the framework that we um, uh, agreed to a year ago and uh, hopefully the, the, the regulations and the, the bylaw that we will uh, again now uh, are going to um, uh, put us on track for, you know, f- um, to have uh, safer neighborhoods and, uh, and keeping our rental stock. And I'll just say this, uh, it was almost immediate that the phone call stopped. People knew, uh, small landlords knew and, and, and others uh, homeowners knew that um, the gig was up uh, once we passed the uh, the framework uh, that the erosion of uh, of the rental market stock uh, stopped almost immediately. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you to staff. Thanks, Chair. I don't have any questions. I'm very happy with the report. Thank you, Councillor. Before we go to the second round from uh, members of the committee, uh, if the committee will indulge me, we'll we'll get uh, questions uh, from people that are not on the committee. Um, so uh, I'll begin with uh, Councillor Menard, please. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Chair. Uh, very happy to see this report uh, today. Really represents uh, an ambitious and comprehensive regulatory framework uh, that's going to clarify and, and render enforceable the spirit um, of our long-standing zoning rules when it comes to um, STR type uses in residential zones. And I think staff need to be congratulated and uh, really celebrated for the work they've put in for bringing to life a really proactive solution to some of the systemic violations that were happening with our city's zoning. And the kind of permit system is exactly what we need more of in the city. Too often we're, we're really seeing a regulatory approach that's more reactive. It relies on our bylaw officers who are very uh, stretched. They're already stretched quite thin. And so this framework is going to see a proactive permit system put in place that's going to pay for those new uh, FTEs to enforce it. And will also generate uh, appropriate funds through the MAT for Ottawa tourism and for the general public. And I, I wanna be clear as well that illegally operating Airbnbs or other um, uh, short-term rentals are of, are of concern, not just because they disrespect our zoning bylaw or because the disturbances that have been caused to neighboring properties or because of the hotel industry's uh, bottom line. Uh, The most concerning aspect is the emergence of uh, illegal uh, STRs is that they're, you know, contributing to the affordable housing crisis and they eat up properties on land uh, earmarked for housing folks longer term. And so I think we zone in areas of the city as residential to ensure that the land is is specifically set aside for housing our residents and has been for a long time. And residential zoning is is a cornerstone of our city and should be treated as as such. Uh, I think this this regulatory framework really can't come into effect soon enough. Uh, And again, thanks to staff for for putting us along this this path. And I I mentioned in the comments to, uh, to the delegation, but there's been a lot of confusion around the proposal initially 
um, really as sort of more of a novel restriction of Airbnbs to primary residents, but as clarifications necessary, Airbnbs and STRs were operating outside of principal residence and have been against zoning and residential zones for a long time now. And uh, that interpretation has also been confirmed by, by our city uh, uh, planning staff. And so um, the, the regulations do extend and, and the legality of STRs and residential zones and changing the zoning to allow for hosts to rent their principal residence through Airbnb, even when they're out of town. Um, and essentially before now, Airbnbs and STRs, you know, run in a similar fashion to bed and breakfasts, um, uh, but a lot of them were not permittable previously. So I think just a huge congratulations to, to staff, to committee, um, to people who have been pushing for this for a long time, a lot of advocates out there. I think this is going to help a lot. Um, those are my comments, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and just before returning to our committee members, uh, Councillor Hubley, please. Thank you. Sorry, uh, it takes a while to get off mute here. Uh, I want to uh, say a couple of things, if I may, on this. Uh, one, uh, first off, I want to thank uh, our colleague, Councillor McKenney. Uh, she's, uh, uh, they have always been able to put a human face on this issue for us. And so I appreciate the, what um, was mentioned about this issue and, and uh, the work she's done in the area. I want to add one more piece to that because in my ward, we did have issues with some of these um, party houses. And it's not just the disturbance at the time and the potential damage that's done to the, the house or neighboring properties. I talked to several people on one of the streets that were impacted. And a year later, they were noticing that uh, when they would list their homes for sale, people would automatically Google the address and up would come the story about the party house. And they were not realizing the full value of their property when they tried to sell it, they were getting negative feedback from potential buyers. And so there, there's more than just the impact of that weekend. And so I, I, I join with my colleagues and applauding staff on what they've done here. Uh, I think um, the flip side of the party houses was uh, we do have retirees that, uh, uh, mainly retirees, that uh, want to be able to rent their homes out for the winter while they go visit family or friends somewhere else for uh, because they're able to go away for uh, one or two months at a time. Uh, and I, I see that we've accommodated their needs in this, so I appreciate that. One question I have for staff is on this discussion earlier about primary residencies. Uh, I understand that we've created our own definition to it as Councillor Leeper uh, read out for us in there, but there is a legal standing for prim primary residence as well that says you don't have to live in there. For example, uh, uh, husband and wife or two partners uh, can own one home and that home goes in one of the partner's names while the second home becomes the primary residence of the other partner without them having to live in it. So uh, what's the potential for a legal challenge to our definition of this saying that you must live in your primary residence? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, perhaps I can um, send this question over to legal services, but uh, on a preliminary basis, I can advise that we looked at the definitions of primary residence that were used in other jurisdictions as well as the definitions that are uh, woven through different pieces of federal legislation for taxation or other purposes. Um, again, the key element is that it has to be someone's home. They can only have one principal residence. Uh, that's what we're trying to aim for in terms of our permit regime. In terms of legal challenges to our proposed definitions, I would uh, address that to legal services. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chair Aguilar, please. Oh, sorry, Chair, do we, uh, I thought Legal Services was going to answer because my question was around uh, the potential for a legal challenge to the definition that we're using. Sorry about that, Councillor. Please go ahead, Stuart. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, Stuart Huxley with Legal Services. Um, further to Ms. Beatlow's response, the uh, 
definition of principal principal residence uses the term ordinary or uses the terms ordinarily resident, and so uh, and and further to the sub to the comments earlier, the language is common language, uh, ordinary usage, and um, so those factors that are in the definition will be looked at, um, and it is our submission that it's a reasonable definition. It's consistent with other uh, bylaws in this particular area, and certainly um, other pieces of legislation may use primary residence in, in, in purposes of taxation or in uh, real property. Um, but in, my, in, in legal's review, the term ordinarily resident uh, gives an indication to uh, someone who wants to engage in this activity that they know that they have, this is their, uh, where they customarily live or reside. Um, and so it should give that reasonable notice and understanding to the public uh, as to what arrangement is, is required to meet the requirements of the permit. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. That addresses my concerns. Sorry about that again, Councillor. Um, Vice Chair Eglai, please, for five minutes. Yeah, thanks. And I'll be quick because I've, I've, had, I've had one chance already. Um, and I'll just give a bit of context to this question. So uh, building on what Mr. Huxley just said uh, and what uh, st staff on, on, the, on the bylaw side have said, you know, they're using terms like home, ordinarily resident, and yet they've answered quite unequivocally that you can rent it out 365 days a year. You don't actually have to live there. And to Councillor Leeper's comments about how he believes the staff have addressed the concerns, one of the concerns was people felt that it was a better way to go, a more, a safer way to go for communities if people had an actual connection to the community. And that was the idea to going to uh, homes that were a principal residence or a person's home to rent out if they spent a month in Florida or a month at the cottage. If I'm not living in that home at all, then I don't have a connection to the community. And that, that repudiates what we heard from the, uh, the general public when we went through our first set of consultations. So again, I'm, I'm not trying to be critical. I think staff have done a lot of good work here a lot of important work here. And my question is this, I don't know if this is to legal or clerks or what have you, but I'd like to find out if there's a way to vote on this particular recommendation, but dissent on the piece uh, with relation to how long a person can rent or the definition of principle or whatever, but to get across the point that the generally the, the, the report is good and, and I'm supportive of it, but I am not supportive of this notion, staff saying on one hand, it's the person's home, it's where they're ordinarily resident, but on the other hand, they can rent it out 365 days a year if they want and never set foot in the property, and we're okay with that. So I wanna find out if I can vote on the package, but without that particular piece in there and dissent on that particular piece. And I think some colleagues around the table may feel the same way. Mr. Mayor, it's the clerk, if I could, or sorry, Mr. Chair, if I could just respond. Uh, to the members' concern. Uh, we have in the past, with regards to budgets, been very clear that members can and do from time to time uh, vote on a particular item, but we'll dissent on literally one line. So I think the, the member is safe to say he'd like to vote one way for the entire package, but has a particular dissent that he would like to share, and that would be fine. And, and uh, so thank you for that, Mr. Clerk. I appreciate that. Um, can... can, can uh, clerk work up what that would look like um, in terms of the vote so we're all we all know what we're voting for and voting against uh, we can mr uh, mr chair at this point in time uh, if the member shares with me the uh, the preciseness or shares with the uh, clerk staff the preciseness of the line he would like the dissent on we can do that so it, it would it would be the definition of principal residence I, I, we, I can't dissent on the fact that there's no cap because it doesn't speak to a cap one way or another. So I think the only thing that I can do and people who have concerns about that is to dissent on the, on the definition of principal residence. Mr. Chair, we can accommodate that. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Councillor Meehan, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick question. Uh, if I am moving into a neighborhood, is there any requirement, is there any way that I can find out if in fact uh, there is um, a short-term rental or um, uh, on my street? Anyone, does anyone know? 
sorry, Mr. Chair, I was having difficulty unmuting and setting <laughs> setting my camera on. Um, that I don't believe that is information that is publicly available. Um, it's certainly not publicly available from the city. In terms of the platforms, um, it could be that through their own uh, advertisements, they um, provide an indication to the public of where sh which neighborhoods short-term rentals are available in. I do not believe that they pinpoint the address uh, just because of uh, personal information and mm -hmm. personal security issues. I realize if the if the address is, is uh, has been problematic in the past, the neighbors definitely would know. But moving into a neighborhood, you might not necessarily have that information. Um, okay. Um, what about uh, what what uh, a, a short term rental have to register with the community association? That is not a rule that I'm aware of in any jurisdiction that we've looked at. Okay. Okay, so it's buyer beware. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Meehan. Um, we now have uh, Councillor Leeper for five, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I, I do just want to give staff a chance to clarify if they can. Um, the, the assertion is there um, that if you don't live in the house, if you're not ordinarily resident there, uh, that you can actually never step foot in the house, that you can still rent on a short-term rental platform. Can can I ask Mr. Uh, can I ask staff, including legal, please, to just clarify for us what does it mean to be ordinarily resident, and what restrictions would be in place for somebody who. Uh, never steps foot in the in the house, but receives all their uh, all their mail there. I just I, I, I'm having difficulty squaring this circle. Mr. Chair, perhaps I can uh, begin this answer by um, again clarifying what the bylaw would require in that regard, and then turn it over to colleagues in legal services to fill in any legal aspects of this. Um, what the bylaw requires will be that any permit applicant complete a declaration and prove to bylaw and regulatory services that the one property that they are applying for, for short-term rental host permit is their principal residence. The declaration will reproduce the definition that's in the bylaw law, that they are declaring that this is where they are ordinarily resident, that this is their home. Um, then they will obtain, if they meet the, those requirements, they'll obtain a host permit. When they do obtain that host permit, they will be accountable for those rental periods, uh, whether they are there or whether they are not there. So as a, as a whole, the regulations that we're proposing today give flexibility to the hosts to be there or not there. So they can rent out their property, provided they have a permit on a short-term rental basis during long weekends, during uh, the winter months if they're snowbirds, but we expect them to be accountable. They have to provide emergency contact information. They have to inform their guests. They have to be responsive to bylaw and regulatory services. If they are not, they are subject not only to fines for contravening the bylaw, but also to having their permit removed or uh, suspended or revoked. So that is the, the entirety of the regulatory regime that we're proposing that places the bulk of the accountability on the hosts. Is that all? Uh, Madam Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, yes, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair. Um, it's based on the, the previous questions, um, I didn't take, uh, staff's presentation or interpretation of, uh, of the bylaw to mean that a person would not have to step foot in, in a, uh, uh, a residence which is offering a short-term rental at any point in a given year. Uh, when we look at the definition that is being proposed in the bylaw, it uses the term ordinarily resident. And I think we can take that as uh, a place where uh, someone customarily, regularly, um, uh, and normally lives. And so um, uh, I think that would requ has a qu requirement that the person lives in the particular, uh, at the particular address. 
if it would be of any assistance to clear, clarify that particular matter, um, if, if my response is not sufficient at this point, um, perhaps a way, by way of an inquiry um, through uh, to legal services and, and emergency protective services, that may be another option. Point of order, Mr. Chair, we're, we're getting two diametrically opposite answers. Bylaw has said, you do not have to reside there. Mr. Huxley has just said, ordinary resident means you are residing there. Bylaw clearly said to both myself and Councillor Brockington that you could rent it out for 365 days a year. So it seems to me that there's words on paper and which will be applied in a very different way in practice. So that, that's, my, that's my concern. I don't, I don't know that an inquiry is going to fix that. Um, I think some of my colleagues may be working on a motion to go forward at council to speak to a cap, but th that, that's the frustration here. And maybe it's not a point of order, I don't know, but that's the frustration, Mr. Chair, that we're getting, we're getting two different answers from two different pieces, uh, two different staff departments. One says, yep, you gotta live there. That's what the definition says. That's your ordinary residence. And I'm saying, yeah, but if you wanna rent it 365 days a year and never live in it, you can do that too. That's, okay. that's the conundrum. I'm not sure that I, I took it to uh, bylaws answer to mean that. I think there's, there is no cap. With all due respect, Jeff, that's what bylaw said. No, so I, I live in this house. Um, I'm ordinarily resident here. If I want to, once my son moves back to school, rent his room out every night of the year, I can. There's no cap. And, and there may be a public interest in, in capping that. Um, but I do have to live here. But there's no injunction against my renting my basement apartment out every night of the year. The but chair it, asked it's if unclear. someone was in four to six months and if their cottage for six months, was that okay? And the answer was unequivocal. Can we have one speaker at the time, please, Mr. Chair? Let's, can let's we have, have a little order, please? Yes, if, speaker if, the committee, if the committee could come to order, please. If, if uh, Mr. Vice Chair, if you, if you do, if you do have a if you do have another set of questions to clarify, please come back on the board and we'll address them. Um, Councillor Leeper, please uh, continue. No, you know what? I, I don't think we've, we haven't heard an answer that is satisfactory to me. I, I think um, uh, Councillor Eglai is absolutely right. Uh, there's a lot of uh, room for interpretation in terms of what bylaw has said here. And, uh, you know, if we're, uh, if we're going to be voting on this, and I don't want to have a resident come up to me uh, six months from now and say, it's a meaningless regulatory regime you've put in place because people don't even have to live there uh, and have them be right. Um, I, I think Chair? we need to understand this. Mr. Chair, it's, uh, it's Jen. I'm just thinking that because we've got uh, two uh, very different opinions and probably amongst everybody I see here uh, more, why don't we take a 10 minute break uh, and have this, the appropriate staff have a conversation and then come back to us. We're, because we can just continue with, I think it said this, but let's just find out what their best advice is. How about yeah. that? Madam Co-Chair, I think that that's a, that's a very good idea. Um, I would also like um, Mr. Mark to take away the question, should there be a majority of dissenters on the question of what the definition of a principal resident is, uh, residence is, what does that do to this bylaw? I think that this committee, this joint committee needs to be very well informed of what sort of decision they're going to be making if we're if we're also going to have people dissenting on that definition. Matt, so, Matt, Mr. Chair, uh, the clerk and I have already discussed that question. Oh, if you'd like to provide us with that answer before we go uh, into a 10 minute recess. Yes, uh, we would we would take that as a uh, I'm going to use the word direction, but it's stronger than a direction. We would take that as an instruction by the committee uh, that a an additional or further definition would have to be provided for council. That's how okay. we would interpret a majority dissent. Thank you. That's perfect. All right. If it pleases the committee, we will adjourn very briefly for 10 minutes for staff to go away and come back with a concrete answer for us on this matter. I appreciate the patience of our committee members and uh, we stand in recess for, for 10 minutes. Thank you.
So to be clear to committee members and members of the public, we will resume at about 25 minutes after 12.
Okay, we're going to be back in action in about a minute and a half. Go, oh, maybe sooner. The chief cook and bottle washer is back at the station with a fresh cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Madam Co-Chair. We'll call the meeting back to order. Um, so, staff, what have you come up with? So I don't know if Mr. Mark, uh, Ms. Bietlo, or Mr. Huxley wants to be able to provide us with the final definition of primary residence, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I do apologize and staff apologize for any confusion that we may have caused uh, with any members of the committee. That's not our intent. Uh, I want to be clear. The proposed definition of principal residence is that it has to be someone's home that that is where they reside. That is how, that is a key element of the permit regime. So they will have to declare uh, uh, that that is, they can only have one principal residence uh, in order for the short-term rental permit. They'll have to declare that and they'll have to declare that they meet the requirements of the definition. So that is where they reside, that is their home. Should there be circumstances where uh, either through complaints, through enforcement action, or through independent investigation through web surveillance that uh, leads the director of bylaw and regulatory services to think that this is not actually someone's home, that the host, uh, this is not the host's home, they have provided misleading information, then the director will be able to take action and investigate. Uh, again, the host, the director will be able to put conditions on that permit and revoke it or suspend it as necessary. So uh, I want to be clear uh, for members of the committee that the intended definition is that it is the host's home. They can only have one home and this is it. They have to declare that this is it for the purposes of their short-term rental host permit. Councillor Leifert, we still have a couple of minutes left on the board if you'd like to resume questions and anybody else who wishes uh, to make any further interventions, please use the raise hand function. Go ahead, Councillor. Uh, thanks, Chair. I, I actually don't think I have any further questions. I think the intent of the definition is clear. Um, you have to live in, in the house that you're renting out. Um, I think if we were to put in place a cap, uh, that would be a different policy direction for us. Um, it, is, it is not something the council has said that the number of evenings that somebody stays in a, a short-term rental in the property next door is the issue. The issue is absentee property owners and those absentee property owners, the people who do not live in the residence are being dealt with uh, through the definitions and the rules that the uh, staff have provided. They've heard council's marching orders and they've given us a very strong regulatory regime in response. So I will just leave it there. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, since we've already been through our first round, we will uh, take questions from, from both committee members and councillors as they come in. Uh, Councillor Bernard, please. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. I just, I think there's a similarity here between what we're talking about with the principal residence in this report and, uh, for example, the principal residence exemption uh, federally when you sell, if you sell your, your home, your principal residence. Um, although there are some uh, potential loopholes people have exploited at the federal level with the pr principal residence, for example, um, the, the regime is still in place and uh, you can only get so specific uh, with, these, with these ones. And so I think staff have asked, you know, answered in a, in, a, in a positive way. When I asked them this exact question, I think Councillor Egla would like to raise the question because when I asked this uh, um, in the briefing before uh, this meeting, staff's response was similar to what they've just what they've just said to us in coming back and i think that that does make sense um and of course it's up to us to enforce these pieces sometimes uh in, enforcement is not always easy and you have to do other digging to do that but it's not unlike other bylaws that we already have uh in terms of uh this our own enforcement here so i would say look at this is a three three year pilot that we're putting in place um i, I think we need to see how this goes upon implementation 
And if there is a need to come back and make some changes and tweaks to this uh, afterwards, then let's do that then, not right now um, on the fly. I think what staff have put in place is, is the right measure. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thank you for your thoughtful comments. I really do appreciate that, Councillor. Um, uh, Vice Chair Aglai, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so first off, I, I want to apologize for being a bit snappy, um, uh, especially to my colleague, uh, Councillor Leeper, who I, I, I cut off. I do apologize for that, Jeff. Um, a lot on my plate these days. and. Um, you know, I do appreciate the work that staff did on the break, and but just for 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 clarification, I'm I'm going to rephrase the question that the chair asked. So, if you had an individual who spent six months in Florida, um, in their mobile home, uh, uh, and came back and spent the next six months out by a lake somewhere, but owned a home in Councillor Leeper's ward would staff take that situation and investigate it with an, a view to determining whether or not that is the person's residence? Or would they say that's okay? Subject to what Director Chapman might say, yes, staff would investigate any information that comes forward that uh, leads uh, that causes concern about the principal residence requirement. The scenario that you described, should it come forward, uh, would be investigated. Um, again, though, uh, I, I'm not aware that st staff don't anticipate those circumstances will arise very often, but yes, uh, those, those would be investigated on a case-by-case -case basis. And I appreciate that answer. I think the confusion is, is in part what Councilor Menard pointed to, principal residence and ordinarily resident sound the same, but they're not the same. And, and so I think that's where the confusion is coming from. But what you seem to be saying now is the person needs to be ordinarily resident in that property. And if there's suspicion that they're not, then that would be investigated and followed up on. So I appreciate that interpretation on the record. And, uh, and I thank you for your work. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Conseil uh, Fleury, s'il te plaît, pour cinq minutes. Uh, je pense que Monsieur uh, Conseil Eglai uh, a mis la presse. Councillor Eglai had pinpoint what should be proposed here. I'd like to have a global perspective. The problem we have now is at several levels, but one of them is that there are some investors groups that have several properties that they rent for short term. And this is regulated in many ways and we want to protect the community and protect the housing stock, the rental stock. So that was said, well said before. Now we're getting into the details of the mechanism. And my question is simple, I think for Valérie or the team. If uh, my uh, spouse and I are one entity, we own one property. If we purchase a second property, uh, whether it is uh, our main uh, or primary property, and we agree to have this on a platform, a short-term rental, and we rent it for 365 days, whether it's me or her, we have a house where we live already, but we would have a second property that will be the primary resident of one of the spouses, could be rented for 365 days on a platform, and and we both agree with that. Would that be would that be allowed? Uh, Mr. Chair, to answer the, the councillor's question, uh, in respect of that second property, uh, in order to get that permit, uh, that spouse would have to prove that it's their principal residence. If there is any doubt that it is not their principal residence, that it is not their home, that it is not where they ordinarily reside, then uh, that matter could be investigated. And on a case-by-case -case basis, that permit could be uh, suspended or revoked or fines would be levied in that case. Uh, so again, the intent is that it be someone's home, that that is where they reside. I can see some issues with that. There's various ways of finding a solution, be it through uh, taxes or 
but I think that today the integrity of the council's goals have been respected. So I will support the report as a whole, but I think that we should pay a special attention to, to this because it's not clear for me. There are some cases, for instance, if I live with a spouse, but she uh, she is the owner of the place where we live and I have another property that I want to rent. Uh, members of my family can do the same thing. So there are several mechanisms here. So uh, the scalability here is limited, but I think that's a factor that should be taken into consideration. And this is something that we'll have to look at again in the uh, next couple of years. We have a three year for a pilot uh, but for now, I think it is in line with the goals that we had given ourselves. Thank you very much. Okay, so voting will uh, roll out as follows on this item. On item number one, uh, we will vote first on the motion, which is the explanation uh, requirements on item number one, and then on item number one as amended. And then we will vote on the motion to correct item uh, number two, and then vote on that report as amended. So, oh, uh, Councillor Fleury, please. Point of clarification, Mr. Chair, the amendments, those are the two motions that you brought earlier in the committee? Yeah, that's correct. So we'll do the first The first uh, motion. Um, I'll have this one put up on the screen. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Clerk. So this is on the explanation requirements on item number one. Is this item carried? Carried. 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 carried? carried. On item number one, as amended, is this item carried? Carried. 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 Item number one being zoned. Wonderful. On item number two, so this is uh, the, the amending motion that was brought at the beginning. Is this item carried? Carried. 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 And item number two, uh, as amended, is this item carried? Carried. 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 No dissents. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll turn the meeting over to uh, our, ch our co chair, Harder, for wrap up. Well, what is there to wrap up? We're in a, had a really good conversation today, everyone, and uh, it was a pleasure to be part of a joint meeting. And thank you very much, um, Chair Luloff, for the work that you did in guiding us through. So um, we don't have a future meeting. Thank you to staff. What a big job, really. Congratulations. Such a good team that uh, has worked on this. And I know it all started with Councillor Deans. And I don't even know how many years ago that was, Diane, but I remember distinctly you raising this and we've had uh, quite the story uh, since then. So it's really, really good that we, we are here today. Um, you know, hopefully we'll have good results at council and then we'll see the efforts of uh, all the work that's gone into it. So thank you very much. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>